everybody. Welcome to a new episode of the MinMax Show, a place about games, friends, and getting better. My name is Ben Hanson. Thank you for being here. I'm joined by Sarah Podzorski. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Arms are flailing. We're joined by Haley. Hey, We're joined by Haley McLean. Hello. Hello. We're joined by Smooth as Silk, Jacob Geller. That's me, Smooth wow. as Silk. That's right. And joined by Jenna Garcia. Hello. Hello. Welcome, everybody. We got a big show. We got a big crew. We have some swaps happening because we have too many games to talk about. We're going to be talking about Assassin's Creed Shadows. We're going to be talking about Indica. We're going to be talking about Lorelei and the Laser Eyes. We're going to be talking about Crypt Master. We're going to be talking about Echoes of the Plum Grove. And then back half of the show, we have a special guest joining us to help answer some community questions submitted on Patreon. That is Jake Solomon, who is the creative director for XCOM. Enemy Unknown. I forget if it was a tweet. I remember at some point the phrase XCOM Enemy Unknown. Oh, wait, no, it's aliens. Like, I always have that framed in my head. I don't know if it's just one stupid joke somebody made 10 years no, ago. No, we know who the enemy is. It's very we're not clear. confused. Yeah. Um, also, XCOM 2 and then uh, Marvel's Midnight Suns, and he's forming a new studio. He left for access, so he's going to join us to talk about that and answer your questions that you submit over there on Patreon. Uh, but we have a lot to get to before that because. Is it, I know it's always the classic uh, refrain that listeners are probably sick of. It's like, there's too many games, but it feels there's like too many games. something happened over the last like two weeks. Like the dam yeah. has burst and it's just They're all good. And they, I want to play them all. That's the it thing. Was, every indie game saw that there was a gap in the AAA release schedule yeah. and every single one of them decided to release in the something last two weeks. Something about May 9th? Like the week yeah. of May 9th, they were like, okay, we're dropping, and I must just miss the memo. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a lot of games that are like pretty damn good, and it's just mm -hmm. bam, 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 bam. So there's stuff like uh, 1000 Times Resist. Is that the name of that game, Jacob? Uh, I'm not sure how you're supposed to say it, but yes. Okay, 1000 X yes. Resist. We don't say Resist. it, we just praise it. Um, but it's a game that uh, Kelsey Loon's very excited to talk about as well. So that's a good one that we'll be talking about in the future here. Crow yeah, Country. It rules. Ooh. And Ooh. I'm uh, only through respect to Kelsey am I holding off on talking about it this week. Okay, all right. Thank you. She appreciates it. Appreciate it. But uh, Crow Country is a game that Sarah was looking forward to in a big way. That's that uh, PS1 throwback survival horror thing. We're going to be talking about that in the future because I know Michael Huber also has been loving it. Um, Hades 2, I feel like I feel like we need to make a pact as an outlet. Like, are we all jumping into Hades 2 now or are we going to wait for 1.0? Or are we just going to have two Game of the Year debates where we talk about Hades 2? I saw your poll, and it seems like most people are waiting until 1.0, at least in our community. Yeah. yeah. I, I hate to say it, they're wrong. Sorry, community. There's more content in Hades 2 right now yeah. than there was in Hades 1, 1.0. I mean, I've been playing it because I can't resist. If it's there and I everyone's have no saying patience. it's good, yeah, I have no patience. I'm right. playing I no it. Patience. It's awesome. All right, let's celebrate it this year then. So we got to get to that as well. Um, Mini Shoot Adventures, which if I had my druthers out of playing all these games, I would go back and finish Mini Shoot Adventures. I'm still pretty far, uh, but... Can I also say I beat it. Yeah? I, I, how you feeling? Me and Haley, both Mini Shoot Adventures Yay. completionists. <laughs> how are you feeling about Mini Shoot? It's great. I'm going to be arguing uh, for the two tens. Wow, for number one. Interesting. Um, yep. And then Animal Well, we talked about it a little bit last week. Uh, Jenna Garcia also rolled credits on that uh, big thing. There is like a fandom for Animal Well that I'm in awe of. And it just feels like people, um, they're having religious epiphanies based on the secrets in that game. But I feel like Kyle from last week was in the camp of like, oh, I rolled credits. It was really good. And Janet, I feel like you're in the same window of, as Kyle. Yeah, I, you know... This was like a Metroid Dread situation for me where like this is a great game that like sent me into a rage spiral Ooh, because I do think some of the design choices are a little bit grating. It is a lot of do you want to retry this puzzle many times, which is cool because that's like the design of the game. But then they're like, do you want to have to cut across three different rooms to do so? I'm like, not really. OK. And after a while of doing that, I just really like. I think that wore me down a lot. Obviously, like, mileage will be vary in that in terms yeah. of if you're so compelled, maybe that doesn't bother you as much. But it's a lot of, like, really petty checkpointing that never really felt like it justified itself through the types of puzzles that it had. Like, this I was waiting for it that that design choice to make sense. And that moment never happened for me. So it's weird because I think it's a great game and I had a lot of fun with it. But by the end... I was so like negative feeling like I still uh, respect Ooh, it as a game, right, but right. it's one of those like, it's like a cursed recommendation. Like 
like, you know, I don't know, like beware of, you have to really know who you are as a player to know if you're going to enjoy the game by the end. I think you'll still like appreciate what it does, but right. like enjoyment, I think that's going to be a very personal journey for people. And if you don't have how like good, you are puzzles. If you don't have the deep endless well of fascination about like kind of the larger, bigger mysteries and puzzles in there that are kind of post credits and stuff. And it's just kind of like, eh, kind of a frustrating. I don't think you need that. I'm, yeah. But that's like, that's like my belief as a player. Like, I don't think you, I don't think games like this, like, I think it's really cool that they have like extra stuff and that they get really deep. But I think the design to credits is really brilliant. Okay. Oh, and like, I still appreciate that in that experience. Like, I don't feel like, you know, I don't think people are selling this game, in my opinion, as like a, oh, well, you really see the real game. Like, you might see more of the game and it definitely has more to say. But I don't think like the true experience needs to be what is like maybe the real ending of the game. Like, I think you can see the design ethos like from a main campaign playthrough. Yeah, right. On. That, that's Animal Well. I'm sure we'll be talking about it more in the future, all that good stuff. Um, does this count as being in the barrage of good games as the announcement, official announcement from Ubisoft about Assassin's Creed Shadows? Or this is a side thing. This doesn't count. We it's can't lump thing. it in. It's, it's, not like, it's not released. It's not even a release, Jacob Geller. We can't talk about it in this window, but we should talk about it. This is uh, Assassin's Creed, formerly Red, is how they were teasing it before as the code name. This is Assassin's Creed finally going to Japan, and they had a whole trailer here and the big announcement that it's called Assassin's Creed Shadows. Um, it's I'm fascinated by the reception of this thing because... You know, we did so many Assassin's Creed cover stories back at Game Informer, and every time it was just the comments lit up with people being like, go to Japan, Assassin's Creed, go to Japan, you have to go to Japan. And I feel like now it's like, we're going to Japan, and I don't, I'm not feeling the communal Well, rejoicing. everyone else has been to Japan. It feels thing. like we have yeah. 10 games set in feudal <laughs> Japan in I mean, the there was same a, exact time era. So right. True. Yeah, Team Ninja did that basically Assassin's Creed in Japan like two months ago, right? <laughs> I guess that's true with Rise of Ronin, yeah, and everyone's like, ah, that's fine. Yeah, so this is Assassin's Creed Shadows. Now, Sarah, it's completely different. This is 1579 for the setting, compared to Like a Dragon Ishin, which was 1853. Ghost of Tsushima was 1274. Uh, Rise of the Ronin, I guess, wow, was also 1800s. I, I was curious. Yeah, I'm proud of you. Do you know what this is? Is this the reunification of Japan? Are we like Nobunaga level? Yeah, this like is... Like reunifying Japan? I think it is I, Nobunaga. I, yeah. I think this is straight up Nobunaga, Sarah. Um, wow, incredible. <laughs> yeah. But Jacob, how are you feeling about the, the trailer there? I, I I had an interesting experience watching the trailer because it was like, if it was, if I had no knowledge of Assassin's Creed Nobunaga and I was knowledge. just watching that trailer, I would be like, nothing could sell me harder on this. Like, I think, I think that that trailer was really good, uh, you know, both in just the kind of the time periods that they're setting up, the two different characters I think I think is really cool where yeah. you have basically you like you have a shinobi and a samurai and like they're clearly very different play styles where you're gonna kinda be doing your stealth with one and you're like big fighting with another. Um I love like the designs of everyone. I think it's cool. I the problem is that like I also know what an Assassin's Creed is and for me it's a series that I haven't enjoyed in like 15 years, you know? And so it's just kind of like, I, I really want to be on board with this game. Yeah. But I do feel like they didn't show any gameplay at all. Sure. And when they show gameplay, I feel like I'm going to be like, Oh, it's an Assassin's Creed. And I just like, I don't like the gameplay pacing of those games. And so it's like, I, I want to believe, you know, I right, really want right. to be in on this. And I'm more interested in this certainly than I was in the Viking one, or in the the kind of smaller scale, Mirage. Uh, the Morocco one, or you know, like any of the other that have have come out recently. Yeah, Morocco so or Mirage? Mirage. It's Mirage. Yeah. Okay. Um, taking place in Baghdad, but it's confusing. Yeah. Baghdad. So, <laughs> so Assassin's Creed Shadows. Yeah, they say um, according to IGN here that it's about the size of Assassin's Creed Origins. Uh, so, so think, huge, huge, but not like Valhalla huge, which was impossibly okay. uh, gigantic and all this stuff. But the, the two characters is interesting. I didn't see that coming, especially when, so they have, uh, basically they have two paths, two characters you can choose. You can swap between them. It seems like whenever you want, like mission to mission, you can choose to be the Shinobi. Who's the lady who's all of, like more of a focus on stealth, uh, or a samurai who apparently is 
this is one of those little things where they said it in a dev diary, and I'm like, that can't be true. But it's the first time you're playing as an actual historical character as a protagonist, because you're playing as a legendary black samurai that existed in Japan at this time. Which, yeah, this guy, he's actually uh, Yasuke as the um, uh, the samurai, I think. And yeah. he's been in, um, or he, yeah, he's been in like a lot of media uh, because the story is so crazy of this like African dude showing up in Japan, becoming a samurai, having connections with all these. But like there's an anime about him. Yeah. I'm pretty sure he's in one of the Neo games oh, or, really? okay. or maybe maybe they're kind of doing some historical but it's like he's he's shown up in a lot of stuff but it's because that story is wild yeah and i guess chadwick boseman was going to play him in a movie before he passed and stuff too um but yeah so you get to choose if you want to be kind of the bigger bruiser samurai or go for the ninja route here and all this stuff and the big uh bullet points is like hey we have dynamic seasons uh all these areas are going to be changing over the seasons in this game as you explore japan so i i'm very curious to see it the part that I may be most curious about, and it's just the dumb industry love and dorky part of me, is y'all remember when we first heard about this game? I think the first time we heard it rumored was like 2021, and that was the big rumor about Assassin's Creed Infinity, about how Assassin's Creed is going to be like a hub that they're going to plug all of these games into and slowly expand, and like Jason Schreier had a big report about it and how it was all pegged to launch in 2024, which felt like a wild sci-fi date at that time, but it's going to launch in 2024 with an evolving map over time. And then they announced this as Assassin's Creed Red in 2022, and even in that then, Ubisoft confirmed the Assassin's Creed Infinity thing, but am I out of the loop? They haven't mentioned Assassin's Creed Infinity once when talking about Assassin's Creed Shadows, right? Like, I was looking through all the official wording, and it just seems like, have they I feel like you're hoping that? everyone forgot. Do you they're think... just like, it's, they're like, well, look, we all said a lot of stuff in 2020. <laughs> So do you really think they're not going to do the whole evolving hub thing? Do you think you're just going back to like, you know what, just releasing these games one at a time, that's about the best we can do sales-wise? This idea of a live service version of Assassin's Creed for even the structure of how they're released is not worth it anymore? I think so. Especially, like, it seems really risky to even attempt to do something like that because you're combining people's hatred for live service with people's hatred for Ubisoft. And that sounds dangerous. But they say two wrongs make a right, so maybe it would work out. But, okay. And also maybe, too, just the the i mean everything's kind of unknown like you never really know how something's going to perform but maybe it seems like too much of a risk to do once they kind of tried to put the pieces together i think too maybe this is it's tough because they they crank out so many titles and i know they have like big teams and like different teams working on different things but i wonder to what degree does feedback and reception public feedback and reception of their releases influence the trajectory of the franchise because i know like with Mirage, it, it, Mirage was weird because it feels like they're like, this is exactly what you want. And everyone's like, mm, I don't know. I don't really <laughs> love it, though. Right, and they're right. like, ah, so then, you know, I, I wonder how much that might have influenced um, what upcoming projects look like. And for all we know, too, it might just be taking longer because they kind of just threw out 2024 right. from a long time ago. It seems tough to call a shot in terms of release year that far out. I feel like there's not a lot of games that successfully do that with when they call out their projects so far in advance. Yeah, yeah, it's it's odd. So November 15th is when Assassin's Creed Shadows is releasing, so I'm curious to hear uh, where's everybody, where everybody's excitement's at. We did a, a Twitter poll. 26% said, I can't wait. 24% said, sure, I'll play it. And then the rest were uh, kind of like, classic, eh. sure. <laughs> yeah, Assassin's Creed, sure. But uh, let's get to the, the real meat and potatoes here. Sarah? Time to go to church, dude. Here we go. You ready? Oh my gosh. <laughs> right. I'm so excited to, to be here because I wanted to hear Jacob talk about this game. Like, I was playing the game and I was like, I can't wait for Jacob to explain this to me. I was watching Sarah's stream of her playing the game and she did indeed say that like every 20 minutes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I don't know about this. And I was, I was not Jacob, raised Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, I was streaming it on Twitch and everyone's like, this is a Jacob Geller ass game. I can't wait to hear his super Catholic take on Indica, <laughs> which is uh, the game that we're talking about here. So, Indica is this game uh, developed by Odd Meter who made like a VR game before this. That's like a archery VR game. And then 11. That's crazy. Yeah, it's really odd. I kind of want to go check it out now. Uh, but 11-bit published this. Uh, 11-bit. Uh, you might know as developers of like this War of Mine and Frostpunk. Um, they're making the Alters, that game that Leo in particular is really excited about on the horizon oh, that game here. Looks sick. Um, yeah. But Indica 
I, I'm halfway through it, and I was listening to Bonus Pod, and you guys were like, is Ben going to like this game? I'm, I'm playing this. I'm like, I freaking love this game. This is, oh, <laughs> this cool, is cool. exactly I my won. flavor of weird. Yeah, congratulations, Janet. Um, Thanks. Sarah, Feels great to be here. Yeah, do you, have, do you have a pitch, Sarah, for what Indica is? The thing about Indica is you kind of have you should probably go into it a little blind because yes. like this game you never see its like next move coming. Like this game is constantly surprising me, constantly like taking twists and turns that I wasn't expecting. They play with like the game media itself. They play with like the overall arching themes are like ideas of like what is faith, what is good, what is evil. It's like a big journey that goes that way. But it was just like I did not know what I was in for and I enjoyed <laughs> The entire ride. I enjoyed every second of it. Well, maybe not some of the puzzles, but I enjoyed okay. most of it. We'll get into that. Yeah, it is funny. Just like, you know, we have a whole system for giving out codes of like, they send over codes, then I'll post in Slack like, hey, does anyone want to check out this nun game? And the amount of enthusiasm for everyone like, yeah, I'm into this nun game. I want to check out that nun game too. Like there's a hungry nun appetite out there for, for a game like Indica of just third person, nun, surreal, meta video game commentary thing. But we've rambled on enough. Jacob Geller, how are you feeling about Indica? Oh, okay, so now it's time for me to explain it. Yeah, uh, just do official your, opinion. Yeah, do yeah, your cool my, the, the way that I've been pitching it to people is is the incredibly strange sounding. Uh, it's funny Hellblade. Yes, because yes. because it's like it is really performance based it is really you know centered on like this this one woman who you're controlling for the whole time um she's hearing voices in her head the whole game but like what i think what makes this game so interesting where things like you know hellblade and other similar walking simulators can be kind of trying is like it is not so self-serious that it becomes a downer you know, it's like right. what's weird about it is that there, there are these really dark things happening and being discussed, but also the game is just so strange. And like the soundtrack is like somehow kind of 16 bit <laughs> and you're like leveling up and there are like these big fake UI looking elements in the world that are kind of like keeping this strange level of separation so you're never like down in the misery that that indica herself might be feeling yeah like you making that comparison it almost feels a little bit like ugh, in the arena of like an edith finch where that just felt so refreshing it's like oh this is a walking simulator simulator but it's just it's fun by and large even though it's dealing with really dark stuff and and it has very specifically a fish cannery level right? uh, something yeah, that i did yeah. not think oh, would yeah. be in multiple walking <laughs> simulators uh, that's a, the surprise and magic of indica but the whole video game meta thing like it starts out with like there's a lot of pixel art in this game which is really great looking and it starts really out with like a video game character kind of falling in a retro style arcade experience there's points on the screen and is my early read correct that they're trying to connect the idea of pointlessness of video game scores and objectives to questioning the point of faith is that what's going on here like suffering of faith is as as pointless as you collecting these coins, which we've told you ten times is pointless. So why are you doing it? <laughs> right. Yeah. The church, I, which I think is really interesting <laughs> and really cool. That's right. There's there's a very fine point on that that happens at the end of the game that I don't want to explain too much, but like I I do think that the last couple minutes are very much a like, hey, this is what it's about. Okay. Uh, thing and also it's like three and a half hours long so like mm -hmm. you know you can get to those last five minutes it doesn't take that much work is it three and a half hours long though if you get stuck in as many puzzles as janet it's and i did like four and a half <laughs> hours long yeah point is how long to be you know i'm not sure. speaking about it from experience i didn't use a guide for most of the game no, i'm doing great yeah you're getting stumped out there janet because there are some kind of obscure puzzles packed into this i one. just don't like i think with this with this being a story game i'm more interested in the narrative component like i'll take a shot at a puzzle but i feel like they're <laughs> they're very like haphazardly constructed like it feels a lot like resident evil if it wasn't designed as well is kind of how the yes. puzzles feel yep. Yep. and like even just visually like so much of village like the village vibe is that maybe it's just because winter time and things are like mechanical but like yep, i fair. did really feel a sense of that and to that point like I, I like resident evil's puzzles but they're not exactly like the i don't know they're not like the the pinnacle of that genre either so i do find and they're also the things are really slow so because of that i'm like i'd rather kind of reach for an answer earlier in this game than like really methodically 
get the wrong answer just to go back for like the clout of doing it. You know, I think in a game that's like, there's no point, like just go. It's like the ultimate God game because it's like you, you yourself don't really care about this. So I'm just going to, you know, I'm just yeah, going to go and, and get I, through it. I don't think the puzzles are really doing much narratively. No. Like no. sometimes they're, sometimes they're cool. Like visually you're like, oh, wow, look at that. But they're not, uh, as far as I could tell, they weren't really like serving the central metaphor it's just kind of like ah push this cart around and eventually was, we'll be able to climb on it there was that one puzzle that did that though that i was like why yeah. can't all the puzzles mm -hmm. be yeah, like this like, because it is exactly what's happening it story-wise but just communicated via gameplay which i think is like a lot of people would ask why is this a game when and like some of the puzzles kind of warrant that critique because it's like i'm just pushing a box like this is so boring but then with puzzles like that i'm like oh my god hell yeah plus in in combination with what you're talking about ben, about ben like gamer bring collection of coins how is the gamer feeling in that moment to try to juxtapose juxtaposition it onto what indica's feeling in the moment with faith yeah was like a really cool combination of games and literature as well too yeah, I think there are a lot of components of this, that, like gameplay wise, that do work in service. And I think that's what makes like the weird puzzles stick out where it's like you just mm -hmm. this felt like a walking. Simu this is an adventure puzzle game, ultimately genre wise. But it felt like it became that because they were too insecure to make a walking simulator. I'm like, just I be agree. a walking simulator yeah. mm -hmm. because I think there's so much brilliance in the um, again, I don't want to spoil it for people who haven't played, but in what Haley's referring to, where there is something that is so perfectly combined mechanically emotionally and to jacob's point like a little humorously too because this game's really like many games have had like you and your companion buddy and sometimes your companion buddies like loki hates you a little bit like in persona like morgana hates like that one guy whatever right it's like oh like a little snippy you know kingdom hearts donald is always like talking smack this is like <laughs> what if this person hated you because you're basically walking with like you know the voice of darkness in your mind right so it's like right. what if someone was there to just like you know talk talk a little smack i mean i'm trying to like not, not no, to swear the show, but like, talk Daxter. a little smack and really point out insecurities that you have and also make sometimes funny commentary because they are sort of trolling you essentially but also hitting you with like a mix of really deep cuts so i think that yeah. works on both levels like i'm playing with the humor but also playing with the seriousness of like at one point there's a discussion of which sin's the worst sin? I think this game also is so much an exploration of what questions come up in faith and how often questions are vilified, I think. And I, so I was raised Catholic mm -hmm. and a lot of, I also like had a lot of these questions. I'm like, am I the devil? Like, I don't know. I'm like, I was oh asking God, totally. some of these same questions. You, do you know? want me to do a poll? Of like, <laughs> what? No, no, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, I mean, that was that was basically it on that part. But oh. um, yeah, I think there are parts that shine, but the parts that don't are really um, clear. And we mm -hmm. I, I it's it is a spoiler, but it's like one of the first things that happens. Can we talk about the bit with the well? In yeah. the beginning, I love that yeah. because yeah. I'm gonna be arguing for it. that as like one of the moments of the year. Yeah, is, yeah, about is, yeah. so so early on you are in uh a nunnery you're in a what what are they called convent you're in a convent and and everyone hates indica the person that you're playing as and and she's just kind of trying to be nice and do good and uh the you talk to this woman and she's like give me some water from the well and so you go you walk very slowly you walk over to this well there is this like very you know kind of comprehensive animation of you like putting a bucket on a chain you gotta lower it down to the water you gotta l bring it back up you pour the bucket into another bucket you carry that bucket over and like put it in a trough next to the nun's door and then it just says one of five and, th <laughs> and then you're like what's the bit here and it's like the bit is you are going to do that five times like, i thought i was gonna get interrupted and the game right. like, no. No, you do this five times and it's very slow meticulous and boring and it's just like the little video gamey thing popping up that's like three of five complete and then you like go back and do it it's just like it's so it is so boring but so funny because the game 
knows how boring it is yeah. uh, right i love it and it's so like that, cheeky too like pretty early on too just having this weird sequence where there's a little dancing character coming out of a mouth and dancing another oh, yeah. character and it's like okay all you need is something really weird and bold in the beginning of a game like this to be like all right you got your hooks to me like i i now i now am so curious to see where the story is going to go because i know that almost anything can happen and then like I think, you know, an early part two that was just incredible is like you're in this room and they use it for largely a puzzle, but having a room just kind of like tearing itself apart and turning red, but you got to hold a button down to pray and it like holds the room together. So it's kind of like two different modes that the room can shift between as you're praying and Indica's actually like reciting prayers as you're going about it. And then when you're not praying, then the voice of darkness is screaming out all this time. Like it's just awesome and bizarre. I loved when you die as well. The voice would just be like, wow, good one. Oh, dignified death. Like, so like, like yeah, screw you, dude. Like, it was like, that com- it was so weirdly comedic, which was so refreshing. Yeah. Against yeah, it, how dark and dreary this game looked. Mm-hmm. It's also, but the environments, like the yeah. environments, it it all felt so familiar, but so uncanny valley at the same time. Like it's, it's not accurately representing the time period it's in. Like they take a lot of creative liberties to just make you feel like it's familiar but you're also deeply unsettled by everything mm-hmm. like i went to like a house and there was like 20 beds there were so many beds they were like stacked <laughs> to the ceiling and like hanging from the ceiling and there was like baby bassinets just like like strung up on rope and you can see like the family on the wall and they're like they had like 20 kids or something and it's like it had nothing to do with the story it was just primarily just to like explain the environment that indica was in yeah the, the environment like and it's it's great how kind of wordlessly they do weird stuff with the environment where there will be things where it kind of happens gradually and then you look around and you're like wait a minute like this is this is completely breaking the laws of the world (laughs) and but the game you know indica is not like what's going on now you know so it's just kind of on you as a player (laughs) yeah right right this game is so much better looking than I thought it was going to be. Like, I heard people talking about it on a podcast, and I started downloading I'm like, wait, it's 50 gigs? What is it? And look, and it's like, oh, it. <laughs> yeah. the characters look great. Even just, like, Indica's eyes, like, darting around early on. It's like, okay, this is a level of production I wasn't expecting from this. That's but. so fun with tech getting so good that indie studios can make hyper-realistic things like yeah. 10 years ago they wouldn't have been able to. And we'd be like, wow, look at this. Like, really, it's just a Plague Tale Innocence came to mind when I first looked at this. Totally. I was trying to think of other really small indie ga- indie studios that are making such hyper realistic visuals. I think it's only going to be more from here on out too, with the engines being so accessible and stuff. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm so excited about weird games like this coming out, you know, in a a time where it's easy to get bummed out about the game industry and Microsoft layoffs and studio closures and all this stuff. It's like, God bless 11 bit for funding weird ass experiences like this, like into, into kind of get out there. They also have, I mean, the, the studio uh, odd meter has a crazy story of like, fleeing from russia oh really? Um, mm. like they're a russian development studio who um fled the country i think in in part because of the you know pretty explicit criticism of the russian orthodox church um uh like you know like they're the game is like not kind of considered uh good speech anyway there's a there's an article on polygon about this i'm i'm summarizing it poorly but it's they have an interesting studio you know in and of themselves uh cinematography in this game is bold as hell i want to say it's amazing but it's just a situation of like if you're just bold enough for the cinematography you will you will be claimed as a genius for it but there are some shots the gopro shots on her forehead where she's frantically running around and stuff i'm like "Ah." Like, there's a stuff works on me there's a shot of like a dog and a wheel we're like oh my god oh my god (laughs) they played that for so long (laughs) and you're like can we stop now and they're like no (laughs) no but it just it makes you realize how boring most game cinematography is it's just Yeah. see something like taken swings yeah uh sarah chat was telling me that um <laughs> you just ended your stream of this by watching veggie tales on youtube yeah oh my god <laughs> that was I, we were like talking the, about like how Bible you know references. everyone has yeah, yeah every, well, everyone has like a different story for how they were exposed to religion and then i was like yeah but like you know what still slaps veggie tales <laughs> <laughs> support veggie tales till the day i die how does that animation hold up Abs- it's still good. I mean, the cool. arm thing, honestly, it's still funny. We watched we watched it a little bit. Still funny. Still yeah. slaps. It was a really good palate cleanser for the end of Indico, which gets a little, you know, like existential. Okay. VeggieTales esque. Um, do, do you know about the uh the VeggieTales like rules that um 
the the series laid out at the beginning or i think it was like the guy talked to his his priest and he told him this the ten commandments uh, not yes. like uh, one that was can not jesus not be a vegetable was yes, that one of the things like he wasn't the, allowed to be depicted the best two are jesus cannot be a vegetable and two uh the vegetables cannot be shown to have a redemptive relationship with god <laughs> where what <laughs> where it's like look the vegetables are great. They can't go to heaven. And you can't imply that a tomato is going to go to That's, heaven. I hate the fact that Larry can't go to heaven. Are you kidding me? vegetables can't go to heaven. What's the downside of What's showing that? a vegetable in heaven? Sorry, Ben. That's only for people. I thought redemptive would mean that they can't, like, sin and then be redeemed. They'd be sinning right? like crazy in that show. That's like most of the show. They do a big old yeah, sin. So they, and they only learn. sin, but they are never redeemed. I don't know. <laughs> I've never seen know, Veggie so Tales. Is I mean, it, is it just like hijinks that's and stuff? Is that the idea? It's is like it? like David and Goliath if it was a squash and an asparagus. Like that's literally an episode. They and like just, make jokes. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's yeah. like slapstick mm-hmm. stuff. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was funny, Janet, talking about I'm I'm the biggest fan of Bonus Pod, which is Haley McLean's Patreon exclusive podcast. If you're a oh Patreon God, supporter, um, but it's funny just listening to that because Janet's like, "Yeah, I'm curious if Ben's gonna like uh, Indica," because like I think he grew up Catholic and he grew up like in a Christian upbringing. I'm like, I, "That wasn't me. <laughs> I don't think I just like." Really? It. How do you know so much Bible stuff? Because we're always talking about the Bible together. Yeah, you I just know that from on your own. You're just reading it for fun. Uh, I just read the Bible <laughs> for fun, Janet. Uh, yeah, I like the Bible, but no, I didn't. I wasn't raised. <laughs> In a church, you're like, I like the Bible, but I'm what not a fan. fan. You know what right. I mean? That's religious. Exactly I have a PlayStation, but I'm not a fan of the of, of the PlayStation. You I, know, just I just the, have one. The PlayStation is culturally important and fascinating, but yeah. no, I'm not a fan. Let's not get wilder. Well, you ha- you you're you're in there. You know, Thank you're you. turning the pages. Thank you. You're so like much. hearing about the sacrament. You know, like it's yeah. You read about it, it's the same difference. It's not that different when you walk up there. For That's me, right. it wasn't. I know yeah. some people obviously care about that, but sure. I think tomatoes are more religious, though, in a lot of ways. Um, uh, there's a game that also is filled with puzzles that Haley McLean, I think, is ready to proclaim the puzzles to be better than the puzzles in Endica. Uh, I mean, it's not a big claim. Okay, well, she's about to claim it, so don't stop her. This is <laughs> Lorelai and the laser eyes, and the proclaimment goes as such. Oh, best puzzles in a game and forever, I feel like. Oh, it's... Uh, and again, for, Starting off, this isn't going to be for a lot of people. Totally get it, but holy hell, it's for me. It's It was made for... Puzzle brain, who just like I have my book open here, and it just looks like the scribblings of a mad woman who's just like going crazy. And one of the best things I love about this game is on PC, you just play it with your left hand. So W A S D and then space bars interact, and it frees up your right hand for writing. And that's totally a creative choice. They that has to be on purpose because the whole time I was doing, I was like, perf. Like I've never played a puzzle game like that where. It, it, at the start, you find you actually find the instruction booklet for this game in in game, and you read it, and it actually comes up a few times in other puzzles and stuff like that, which is kind of cool. But in it, it was like you are supposed to be go get a pad and paper and pencil. Like you should not be not writing things down as you go. I like but that. The nice combination of this, I remember this, Jan, this is something you talked about with Botany Manor. You don't have to go re-review stuff. You have a photographic memory. So I just have to press space whenever I want, and I can go look at whatever I've already looked at right away in a menu. So I don't have That's to go, so nice. oh, what was the Greek so letter nice. alphabet I needed to know about for this puzzle? Sometimes I can just I press take space pictures and find of my it. phone. Yeah, yes. same puzzle yeah. games. Like, yep. Oh, that's huge. Just, it feels ridiculous. Yes, and they they acknowledge, they acknowledge that they're like uh, she has a she has a photographic memory. Let's move on. We don't need to finally using this game anymore. powers for good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, and they also separate it to categories, which is really nice too. So it was like specific notes from your brother who's missed, not the character's brother, but a brother who's missing. It's like those are in their section. So anytime I wanted to go look at that, I could just look at oh, that right and away. They organized it. And based on the when you find it and like kind of its relevance too, because once you read something, it's like, okay, I already solved a puzzle that has to do with the stuff this book is teaching me. It's like I can just skip over that from now on. It's not like there's little clippets in every book of like five different ways to solve five different puzzles. It's like one book is for solving one puzzle. It's like perfect. That's so nice and separated. And another thing I really well, besides the fact the sound design's insane and it's so pretty looking and all like there's such a dip, like a variety of different puzzles that you're doing so much different stuff all the time. Um, I really like that everything logically naturally flows forward. Like I'm never just like that doesn't make sense. Oh, anyways, because right. like I've been playing this where guides don't exist yet, which has been 
so hard. Oh <laughs> like my god! Yeah, my little gremlin brain is used to just being like, oh, I'll just look up this one, and then I won't look up anything. I can't do that. So I've just been sometimes I get stuck on puzzles for a couple of days, and it's only in coming back I'll be like, okay, this makes more sense now, and I'll, something will click. I'll read something else. And You're so, playing games within games to solve puzzles. Else, like I can't even. There's oh okay. So hang on, let's, let's zoom out a little bit. So Lorelai okay. and the laser eyes here. It's Simogo, the developer. They made Sinara Wild Hearts a couple years back. Year Walk and Device Six on mobile, like those games were really cool. I played those back in the day, um, and then Annapurna published it. Um, but you, from the trailer, it's like, oh, are you just in like a Resident Evil style mansion that's just filled with wacky puzzles, or what's like the idea here? So you come in, and even just getting into the hotel is a puzzle. Like there's okay. three or four gates to even get in there, and you have to solve things and and this dog brings you a little letter with a clue on how to open the front gate and stuff like that and uh so yeah you're essentially you you get asked to come to this hotel and there's this weird eccentric guy who's in there and he's trying to he's trying to get you to find all his script pages but then through you examining the house and walking around um you realize that like there's a few different things you can be working on at any given time. And then it has a percentage of how much you've completed. And the game tells you, you need to finish this game a hundred percent to beat the game. Like you need to like collect everything and do every puzzle. It's not like, Oh, I did. I I skipped three puzzles, but I still saw it in credits. I I really think that you can't solve the final puzzle, which is accumulation of three different things all together that you have to input and then you get the ending. You can't do that without first collecting everything and getting the answers because where I'm at right now, I have two thirds of all the info I need for that final thing, but I can't know if that's right until I have the final pieces, which I'm still collecting to insert it and then be like, correct. And then the game's done, I think. But I I also feel like, I don't know, maybe I'll enter it in that and there'll be more puzzles, but I'm at 70, like 6% completion. Or something like that, and there's still puzzles I need to figure out and do. Like everything's showing up at a nice pace. I feel like I'm ranting, but there's just no, everything's no. really clicking and feeling really good for it, what I want it to be doing. Is it because I'm of too your afraid Nancy? to play it? So I'm glad that you have a rant to provide because <laughs> yeah, I'm scared to play it. It looks hard. Is it just just like the Nancy Drew expertise of playing 35 of those freaking games in the series Perhaps. like coming through now? Okay. I think that may have trained me a bit. <laughs> yes, like to really like that gameplay loop. Of here's a weird little box. Open it, and I'm like, what? And you just like fiddle with it. The sound design's really good. So anytime you're opening like a little key thing and you're sliding things forward, it'll like make the exact sound. And you have to always try the lock before you're allowed to leave the puzzle. So I can't press escape and back up. It makes you huh. try to pull the lock before you leave, which I think is also kind of interesting. Yeah. Because it encourages you just to make a mistake. It's like, oh, I don't know it. Make a mistake, walk away. But then you also hear that awesome animation sound of just like the lock being like and like doesn't pull down far enough and you're like oh and walk back and then the pause scene when you're thinking about things and rereading things they have like brown noise or something playing in the background which i also was like that's so perfect because it's like going into your it's like the mind palace kind of energy going to your head to think about oh let me reread that book that i read a few hours ago but to be greeted with like brown noise or i think it's brown noise because i'm a huge nerd for brown noise it's like my favorite type of white noise adjacent stuff it's the <laughs> what best. are you talking it's, about that is the, the nerdiest ocean, thing if it was a sound if it was a constant one sound it sounds so good huh. i listen to it when i work all day but they what? play that yeah you just listen Look to brown noise hang on it, as soon as up. as soon as i hear brown noise i feel my brain go and like take a breath i don't know what it is but i love the feeling of it and they play that in the pause screen while you're thinking of things. And I also think that's such a cool creative choice. That's They're like, we want people to have fun and, and you're going to get frustrated, but here's a little space to just think about stuff and calm down. Now, the brown noise, that's different from the brown note. This is yes. just constant yep. ocean. I guess we'll it- find out. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. But they play like that's also such a cool creative choice. There's a few different mm-hmm. things like that that I'm like, neat. Oh, I've never seen a puzzle game be like, let's give them a mental break in here and give me audio to relax to while I'm thinking of things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it would be cool. so annoying when you're like in those menus going through your clues yeah. and it's like not. Da na 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 da, and you're like, could you just for, <laughs> can we stop with the like one minute repeating song? Yeah, it's when you hear the music the most, and it's the most grating is in those mm-hmm. moments because you're just rereading stuff. And Nancy Drew's the sucker for it. They'll just be like, na 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 na, and I'm like trying to read Greek alphabet letters. I'm like, shut the hell up. You know who did that really well is uh, Like a Dragon. 
like for infinite wealth, like in the tutorials, every time there's a pop up in the tutorial and there's actually text to read on the screen, they'll give like they'll transition to like a really, really subtle version of the music that's playing. Oh, Even if it's nice. like really intense combat music or something, it's such a nice move. Um, oh. Hey, can I tell you my my super dumb guy experience with this game? Yeah, because I recommended this to Jacob, and I don't think he liked it. I always feel I, bad. Well, I like because you largely, I think, recommended it on the aesthetics, which are mm -hmm. great because it like it really looks kind of like a, you know, kind of like a Suda game, you know, very killer seven, like killer seven, yeah. something like that, which I really liked. But I, I got in and I started playing and I got, you know, I got the note from the dog. I got into the hotel. And when I got into the hotel, my experience was there were four locked doors and each locked door just had a four digit combination lock. And so it, it was like, OK, <laughs> I'm sure the solutions are around here. Probably this poster next to the door is somehow giving me the numbers. But it was just I had a very negative reaction to it because it was like they were all the same puzzle. You know, it felt like right. it was like. You know, it was like, hey, if you can't solve this puzzle, go solve another one. But they weren't different kinds of puzzles. They were all just like somehow intuit four digits from this like scenery next to it. And and I just kind of immediately clocked out because it was just I was just kind of fr I was like, this is what the game is. It's just combination locks, like four combination locks is the first puzzle that you're going to give me. And I'm sure it's way more than that. But it was like it did not make a a good impression on me as someone who's like not super puzzle minded. That's fair. And I know the puzzles you're talking about, it's almost kind of like there's groups of puzzles that all work the same way and they'll be parsed out around the map. So you're like, oh, this is a like you're talking like a poster puzzle. Like I'll let's work on a poster puzzle. And then if those don't hit, you can walk off and like try to find other like they clump together thoughts behind how things get solved. So then eventually it's not so much just what is a forward letter combination or how do I insert this block into this series of letters or something it's like oh this is a block puzzle this is the poster puzzle blah blah you can start to learn those but that's not obvious until you've been playing it for a few hours which I think is a fault and probably why a ton of people are going to bounce off because they'll walk up to the first puzzle be like what the hell and try to fiddle around with it before maybe doing a whole loop of the whole mansion where then you learn like that the the posters are the the guy who owns the hotel's past movies and they all have like a different backstory of why he made them and blah, blah, blah. And then it starts to make sense to why he would lock stuff behind his movie post. Like, it's weird, but huh. it requires you to really pay attention to kind of every little detail, which I t like totally. Yeah. Get why and I guess I I thought fun. it was, you know, I thought it was going to be like that. It's like I, I do like The Witness, you know, which is fully yeah. like, you know, a, a super puzzle game. Um, but, you know, it's like in The Witness, it's like, oh, I kind of don't get this type of puzzle. So I'm going to like wander around. And it's like this one, this one is about like obstacles in the path. But this one's about like listening to the noises and whatever. And I kind of thought that this was going to be like, OK, one's going to be a combination lock and one's going to be like a maze and one's going to be like a math problem. And so to just kind of get there and have them just be like four combination locks, like just figure it out felt yeah. Even if the solutions are found in different ways, I was just kind of like surprised because it felt it, it was weird that all the solutions were like in the same format, if that makes sense. Yeah. And those are the first puzzles they hit you with in the foyer type area where it's like yeah. that. If you're not into it there, like, why should I keep looking in this big house kind of energy? Like they right. could have yeah, maybe that, sparse them out better. It really it really just felt like I, I found four of those and I was like, I guess this isn't for me. And I, I feel like if there was like a different kind of one, then maybe I would have felt more like, ah, oh, the game's going to have options, you know, for me to figure it out. But yeah, I like I, I, I have kind of decided that I will respect this one from afar rather <laughs> right, than diving into it. Lorelei and the Laser Eyes. It's on Switch. It's on Steam out now if you want to check that thing out. Um, hey, Sarah, another yeah. game that you're really excited about that we talked about a little yeah. bit earlier this year is Echoes of the Plum Grove. Um, yes. And now this thing is actually out. Um, this is from Unwound Games, and it's... Stardew Valley Paper Mario? Is that what's going on here? It's like Stardew Valley Paper Mario meets the original 13 Colonies. Okay. Meets life and death. Okay. And generational wealth Perfect. is how I would describe this game. This game, 
is they really took a it's really a fresh take on like a farming sim or like a slow life game like the entire opening of the game is your character getting on the mayflower basically and the entire ship sinking and everybody dying except you (laughs) and you show up in this called like honeywood town you're the only your sole survivor of this horrible horrible shipwreck your best your best friend literally is on that ship with you it's like i can't wait to go to the new world and live together dead dead um so like you get this like rundown farm um some interesting like swings they took with this game is there is a hunger bar so you have to eat and if you don't eat your character you know gets tired and you could die and if you die in this game it's a perma it's a perma death unless you have children and then you will live on as your children. You can select a child, and that is your new, like, <laughs> main character. That's scary. Buckle up, Jim. I know. It was scary because in the first week, I had no money. I couldn't buy anything. I'm, like, I'm like picking flowers. And to sell things in this game, and there's no, like, shipping bin. You have to trade them with other villagers for Ooh, gold or items. Okay. So you're like, will you please take these leaves that I picked off the ground so I can afford to eat tonight? <laughs> um, and then I got sick. I got the common cold and I had to pay like 50 gold to get diagnosed by the doctor, which was all my money. So I couldn't afford to eat that night. And then they were like, you should get, you should get, you should buy some medicine for 200 gold or you might die. You might, it might turn into pneumonia. You might die. And I was like, I can't afford that. So I had to just be sick for like, and uh, like fingers crossed. I don't kick the bucket. Um, But is it really that bad if you die to go back to the indica conversation? You permadeath. Well, in this game, you actually permadeath. Okay, but so like, you get start cold over. and you like rush to get pregnant. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, yeah. once you have a little baby, is it just? I think it'd be kind of fun to die then and just get to be a new character. Well, you can adopt a child too. So okay. it's like if oh. you can't get married fast enough, or you're just like worried that you don't have like a backup, um, you can also adopt. <laughs> um, this game's just really interesting with how it handles. Like, I I will say like because of the like people in the town will die and they'll get married and you know they'll kind of fill roles and you can see them having kids and stuff like the kids look like the parents but you it, like, you never get too attached to npcs like all their personalities are kind of like randomly generated basically um so it's not like heavy on the personal interpersonal relationship of the characters but it's fine when you consider that everyone's going through this like you know, sort of cycle of, like, dying. The kids will take over the <laughs> jobs that the parents once had. Your child will eventually, you know, take over your job. Unless you can choose to, like, apprentice your child as well. So, like, your child can go to school, be an apprentice, or help you on the farm. So it's like, I could technically, you know, I'm trying to, like, pop out as many kids as possible because I'm tired of watering these plants. Like, we gotta ramp up operations. Automation. Okay? We gotta ramp this shit up. So, <laughs> I will say it's a little bit of a slow start yeah because you see all these really nice things but you realize that it's sort of like a generational wealth occurrence so you kind of have to get started and like get everything going right um and then like i just got married so i married the blacksmith and he gives me like 40 gold a day i know thank you um he gives me 40 gold a day we just had our first child so i have to wait for them to age up so i can enslave them on my farm great (laughs) mold them to my beliefs right. so you can you can see the goal and then it also has a very like stardew valley bundle where you know you fulfill bundles that's kind of like the end game thing right but the weight like i don't want to spoil it but i was just like they showed the bundles and i was just like what the heck this is what you decided because there's no community center it's just i i it was it's one of probably the weirdest strangest bundle Goals? I don't know, gameplay systems in a farming sim that I've okay. ever seen. Okay, I'm into it. Uh, Haley, I was complaining about it didn't have Steam Deck support. I started it, then I was like, what is this crap here? Yeah. But you're saying that it does, Haley? Am I, am I missing out of here? Uh, nah, I backtrack my thoughts on that because <laughs> I kept playing it. Uh, it's like okay. that's, I tried to reconfigure it and like almost set my own buttons because I really want this seemed like a cozy bed game. Oh, and yeah. I, Play it on on PC. Okay, all right. Yeah. Echoes of the Plum Grove. Slow start, but cool ideas for a farming sim. That's the takeaway mm-hmm. here. That's awesome. Yeah, check back in uh, if you keep playing this thing. But more farming sims should be about death. That's yes. actually a great way to view that. <laughs> Everything I think means you more than kill people too. Like my mother in law was like the bitch of the village apparently. <laughs> And she died, and the whole village went to her funeral, and you have, like, expressions in this game. Like, the villagers can, like, cry and be upset. 
everybody at her funeral was smirking <laughs> with glee. Like I had been to other funerals and they're like crying. Ooh. Everyone at this woman's funeral smirking. I was <laughs> terrified. <laughs> That's great. Perfect. Uh, another game, because uh, they don't stop coming, is Crypt Master. Crypt Master, out now on Steam. I don't know how the hell you bring this thing to consoles without it being clunky eventually, but Crypt Master, it is... See, Janet and Haley and I have been playing. It is Dungeon Crawler... Think like... Hangman. Yeah, Jacob Geller, imagine like wizard, wizardry meets scribble knots. Uh, just like the concept of wizardry? The, <laughs> just like, the, there's a wizard? No, the game. The classic game. Or, or Ultima Underworld. Anything in that vein. Janet, you got a good pitch for, for Crypt Master? Take your stab at it. And it pitched me on it, so then I immediately played it, because she made it sound awesome. It's a long pitch, because there's a lot that goes into the game. I think the shortest <laughs> pitch is that it is a dungeon crawler typing game that has hangman mechanics so it is not a game that is about dexterity and speed there is a little bit of that in terms of the combat but one you can turn that into turn based and two like i noticed when you pull up the menu of your abilities you don't get attacked and i'm like wish i knew that when i first started playing because i was frantically oh really oh i've been jumping it up just like okay i gotta see this real quick yeah but it's kind of more fun that way i'll get into that later but that's the long and the short of it so when you enter into an area like it ends up being you know, shortly into the game, it's you and your party. Classic, no one remembers anything. Plenty of video, normal video game stuff. And you have this Crypt Master who is the cover art of the game. If you like look up the game, that skeleton guy, that's the Crypt Master. He's like, hey, you're trying to get your memories back, but also like you're working with me to like reach above. And I don't know if he's going to, am I evil in this game? Probably like, I don't care because I like typing. <laughs> um, but you explore and like one thing you do early on is you like approach a chest you open it by typing in the word chest the crypt master appears and you get to play a i think like five um hint game of like 20 questions but they're like you can ask like sense-based things so he's like if you can remember this item like you gain letters and he'll say you know like ask me something about it and you'll say touch and he'll be like oh it's steely and you'll say like wear and he'll be like ah you can't really wear it you're not supposed to wear but you, you technically can and then at the end, you have to guess what the object is. You have the letter, like the blank slots. So, you know, if it was like a cat, you'd have like three spaces and you have to like type that in, get it right. If you got that right and it was a cat, you get the letter C-A-T distributed to your party. That fills in the letters under their name and those (laughs) words are their abilities. So you'll get an ability like boots or hits. So you're kind of guessing as you play and gain letters, what is your party's abilities? And then you use those abilities in combat. And then sometimes the um, words you get are also like lore words where you can like learn more about your character's history. So they're not all ability based. But what's really fun about this game is just how dynamic and original I think all the ideas are. Like one aspect of the game that I think is really dynamic is the fact that with that ability example, like let's say I get I, you know, as one of my letters and I'm thinking, oh, maybe it's hit. At any time in the game, I can type, other than combat, I can type hit, and, like, if it's right, they'll give me that ability. Like, you don't have to wait. It's not like, oh, you have to grind to earn the perfect letter, or, oh, you can only guess so many times. You can kind of guess whenever. Um, It's it's bizarre. It has, like... I am so compelled by this game. Every time I see a treasure chest, I am more excited to get to that treasure chest than any other treasure yeah. treasure chest in any other game. Because I go up to it and it's just like 20 questions fantasy wordle with them mm-hmm. trying to get and then you and then you get to and you never know what letter is gonna pop out of that and how it's gonna fill out and maybe Appealing give you new to abilities. The wordle heads is a good idea. I was it literally is. gonna ask. I was like, if I play the New York Times like connections and wordle, am yes. I gonna like this? Yes, yes, you will. Yes, yeah. we guarantee you will. Yeah. It's like if Pat Sajak was really into old Elder Scrolls games. It's just like, it's funny thinking of you, Janet, with Wheel of Fortune. Because I remember we did that new show Plus Run a little while ago about Wheel of Fortune. You'd never watched Wheel of Fortune before this. But this entire yeah. game is just like old ass RPG Wheel of Fortune vibes. Yeah. But it's very satisfying. It's an old head game for new minds or something. Because it just yeah. looked very like classic. And it's um, just design sensibilities. The way you kind of move on a grid. And it, it feels very old in that sense. But it's it's also fairly simple to play like i think it's very approachable um and then as i'm on like the second level and what i've liked so far is to as you go a couple new layers to the gameplay open up like to cast your abilities after like that first area you have to like spend souls and you can gain them by finding bugs in the world like on the walls you like type in like hog fly and then you like 
eat the bug and then you gain the souls to like spend is and it kind of has like a nice like flow to it i also reached this part where you can approach these like statues and the statues straight up will just ask you a riddle and um you if you get the riddle right same deal you get like letters but what's cool about this game too is they have a lot of fun adjustments in the setting so everything i'm describing can be slightly tweaked to like allow for more hints or in baked into the game design like with those riddles the crit master can answer a certain number of them for you but like your reward is less big if you like do get it right um but those are just like very traditional riddles it'll like one was um like i i trim all day but i always have a beard or something like that and it's like that one i don't know i don't want to spoil it but like you know it's like you have to guess what that is same deal they have the spacing um also a really fun game to stream like my chat had such Ooh, a blast yeah, like fun. trying to guess the stuff and like it was that perfect balance of challenging to guess, but not like, I think one of the problems with like puzzle games sometimes, because this is kind of a form of a puzzle game, just like a word puzzle game, is sometimes it's not even that you don't know the answer. It's that when you know the answer, you get pissed off. You're like, really? That's what it was. All right. All right. You don't want me to solve it. What? You know, it's yeah. almost like this visceral reaction. I never feel that playing this, even when the words are a little bit more obscure, because it just feels it's so perfectly earned. I think because it has that mix of I love when a game can allow for player input and conclusions at different pacings, but also provide handholds for if you can't get it. Like you can always just find enough letters to gain right. a lot of these things. The but part, also, if you're good at guessing, you can do it earlier. Yeah, the part that blows my mind around about it, too, is that you're typing in one word guesses and stuff and prompts whenever you want. And the narrator is as hammy as the narrator in Indica. Um, and yeah. they're constantly just responding to what you're saying. And so it almost feels like an old text-based adventure game where you can just type in any word and be like, oh, you think there's a door around here somewhere? Because you wrote <laughs> yeah. door. Or like, you know, of course, I'm a 37-year-old man, so I wrote in the word but immediately. And he goes, hmm, is that where you're hurting on your mm, butt? It's like they record a dialogue for like any one Every word act. thing you could put in there to the point that I had to look it up like, is this AI? It's like, no, no, no. They just recorded a boatload of stuff to try and guess everything you might be typing in for one word prompts in different situations. And I'm excited to hear Janet say that when she went up to the statue, it was giving her puzzles because I destroyed it and hid it because I was oh, curious. Oh, that's a different if statue. Oh, okay. Oh, that was like, thing. is there a choice? Yeah, yeah. Something I was really wanting this to have too is like choice based things that could I happen if too. I was nice to the statue versus an asshole to the statue. Maybe that comes a bit later, but like the, I think the one thing that was kind of holding me back on this, I was having a lot of fun, but like every time after a battle, like typing the healing spell over and yeah. over again, mm -hmm. that right. got kind of annoying. I wonder if later on you get the ability to just like press like V or something to heal and you can like keep on things to do it quicker. I, it's, a, it's a typing game. So I feel like they won't give me shortcuts to type, but who knows? <laughs> that was like yeah, my so only complaint. Yeah. I, I agree with that because it is a little bit of a pain. Like, and the way healing works again, everything is like letters based. So if you're like, if you're, if your party member's name was Ben, it'd be like, Oh, Ben got hit. He's, he's B now. You have to like, you know, type in the healing right. spell to like get the E and then the healing spell. Again. So it is like a little repetitive in that sense. But I think it's because they do want you to like spend those souls to heal once you get to that second level. Yeah. You do get other healing type spells for other people that are like shorter. So okay. that helps. And then you can always auto heal at those statues, which are kind of like the checkpoints. But yeah, so I think that'll help a little bit because also too, as someone that's like cheap with in-game currency, I'm like... Oh, can I afford it? Maybe I'll just walk eight free, eight rooms back to do it for free for no reason. Mm -hmm. um, and I think also, too, when you so when you beat enemies, which it's like you type in your commands or your skills to like attack them, they also drop letters like you can select a letter from them that you get. So, I mean, it's kind of like the classic grind system in a sense where instead of grinding for XP, you're almost grinding for letters. But it feels really rewarding to like redo combat i feel like a lot of games when it comes to enemy respawn it's like well i guess i get stronger but really i just feel like i'm getting kind of punished for being a little lost and here i yeah. i feel more compelled because i like getting those letters and like gaining my additional abilities and not it's just fun. like a generalized level yeah it's just fun to, to jump into a game like crypt master here and just really having to stop and think like what is this how is this designed this is such a weird idea yeah. but it, it's fun and like you know i was a huge fan of that typing rts last year mm -hmm. called touch type tail but this it's like a slower paced version of that but it's just a lot more different ideas packed in here but crypt master on pc now paul hart and lee williams developed this thing you can you can check it out uh, i can't see it coming to any console besides no. 
PC. No, maybe mobile or something would be interesting. Maybe but, mobile. Uh, mobile would would work. I, I think. think it could. Yeah, uh, Janet, thank you for being here as always. Um, you got other podcasts to record and worlds to conquer and um, uh, fiance now to hug. I don't know. This sure. <laughs> Why not? They can hug now. They can hug. Engaged. Hell yeah. yeah. You can't hug before you're engaged. Uh, I full- would never. I would have never even thought to. <laughs> All right, Jan, you want to <laughs> clap out when you're ready? Sure. And let's not try I to be. I miss Janet. She wish, just left and I, I miss her. I wish mm-hmm. Janet was still here, but we do have each other and we have each other answering the age old question of, do we all know how this thing operates? Do you ever get tired of asking that? Like every week Honestly, when you throw it out, are yeah. you like, I hope someone <laughs> makes a joke out of it or I hope someone just says it? I don't even like saying that if I'm being honest, Sarah. It barely makes sense. There's probably a better way to pitch Min Max as a patron outlet other than that sentence. That forever. Well, that's the thing. You've I was going to change it years ago and the outcry from like the Min Max community of the Discord is like, no, that's like an iconic thing of the podcast. Like I... It's. It feels like a solid three out of ten Knowing for me. The, the you existing hate community it. will never steer you right. I hate to say they are always going to love the dumbest, shaggiest parts of the podcast. Yeah. That's right, Jacob Geller. Patreon. Patreon.com <laughs> slash minmax with two N's, everybody. You go there, you find the tier that is right for you, and that makes this whole thing sustainable. As long as you're sustainable, that makes uh, this outlet sustainable. So shout out to everybody who's unlocked a tier that works for them. And, of course, a big thank you to some of MinMax's biggest supporters. I'm talking about Squarespace. This video podcast is brought to you by Squarespace. Are you ever just, honestly... This is off the record, you guys. Are you ever just horrified by like the lack of websites? Are you ever looking up like an indie developer and they're like, Wait, they don't have a website? This is me looking for like art assets for podcast thumbnails. I'm horrified whenever a professional, anybody on earth doesn't have a website. And now Squarespace- Just say me, just say you're horrified with me. <laughs> you know what? You should, honestly, Jacob, I wasn't thinking of you, but you should totally have a Jacob Keller website. I probably should. You're, you have a book, you have a whole podcast, yeah. you have a whole YouTube channel. And I have just a thing for you, Jacob Keller. A yes, book. I'm ready. Uh, no, Squarespace. Uh, it's the all-in-one website platform for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online, whether you're just starting out or managing a growing brand. Squarespace can help you build a website because on Squarespace's sites, you can have your video collections all ready to go there. You can upload it directly to Squarespace or embed it, obviously. You have a beautiful looking library. You can do client invoicing on there, Haley, for all your lawyerly needs. Um, Sarah, you can sell content on a site if you were to build one through Squarespace, but through a very easy to use interface. If you're into analytics, uh, Squarespace has you set, so uh, it's got everything I need. So you can check out squarespace.com for a free trial for the website uh, creation tools. And when you're ready to launch, you go to squarespace.com slash minmax to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Squarespace.com slash minmax, get 10% off, build a website, everybody. You deserve it. Also, shout out to Fume, the flavored air device that uh, the goal is to help uh, help you quit a bad habit. I, genuinely, Leo was over here, I think, for the podcast last week, and I wasn't um, paid to do this, but I said, Leo, I know I'm always talking about it and playing with this in every recording. Come just touch this Fume device. And Leo grabbed it. I thought it was a bird whistle. From D&D. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry, it's and actually a fume device. Stranger Danger, and he ran out of your house, right? No, actually, Leo, he's like, give me a hit off that. And then he's like, it's just, <laughs> there's <laughs> nothing There's nothing here. This is just an empty tube. And it's like, yeah, that's the point, is you can put some flavored air in there if you want, but you don't do anything beyond that. It's just a tube. Uh, it's flavored air. It's not a, va- uh, not a vape at all. It looks and feels so good. It's got a, like, magnetic snap to it. You can twist it. Can you do a it. trick? Can you do a trick? Wow. What's a Ooh, trick? ASMR? Like um, a little flippy, like a like a flippy trick. I don't know. Do you call this a trick? Okay, well, I, I yeah. dropped the fume. But oh, shout out to fume, everybody. Audio Thanks. listeners, he flipped it eight times in the air and caught on his nose. Gulp. It served over 300,000 customers. You can, get, you can be the next success story with fume if you're looking to quit a bad habit. So for a little, limited time, you can use the promo code MINMAX to get a free gift with your journey pack. Head to tryfume.com. That's tryfum.com and use code MINMAX to get a free gift with your order today. There's a description in the link for all this fun stuff. And shout out, of course, to our dear friends at I Am 8-Bit. They want everybody to know, as if you didn't already know, that the soundtrack to Hades freaking rules. And you can get the soundtrack to Hades on a four 
vinyl four disc? Is that what you say? Are vinyls discs? Four disc vinyl soundtrack? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Or sleeve sometimes. Yeah, just a four bundle. Vinyl soundtrack for the Hades One original soundtrack from Super Giant Games, an incredible soundtrack built for vinyl and constructed for vinyl thanks to I am 8-Bit. So they have that in their wonderful online store. You can't go wrong with their wonderful online store. Everything good under the sun is in the wonderful online store from I am 8-Bit. And the beautiful thing is you can get 10% off of everything in I am 8-Bit's wonderful online store by using the promo code Got it for my mama. Got it for my mama is 10% off everything in I am 8-Bit's wonderful online store. So check that out. I am 8-Bit they're so wonderful. They support the Midnax community in such a huge way by shipping out a prize each and every week to whoever submits the best question on Patreon. If you support us at any tier on Patreon, you can submit a question each and every week. We choose our favorite. They win a prize. This week, it's the Oxenfree vinyl soundtrack being reissued wow. thanks to I Made Bit. Awesome soundtrack. So they will be shipping out a prize like that to whoever wins the question of the week. Should we get to these community questions? Yes. Well, we can't do it alone. We need some... More developer insight. You ready for this? Jake Solomon, welcome to the MinMax Show. I'm happy to be back. Welcome, sir. We had Wait, to... I've been here, right? I mean, well, I've, yeah, I've been here. Not Midnight really. Midnight Suns and... You know, it's completely oh, different. So that, that, different? Was, that was a MinMax interview where it was a more formal one-on-one -on -one thing where I was really uh, oh. asking you the deep probing questions. This is just kind of slapstick fun hour with community questions. So you can sit back and relax this time around. Ends on his best behavior in the interviews. Here yeah. he's, he's a menace. <laughs> Oh, okay. That's fine. I, I didn't take the interview seriously either, so it's fine. We can just, I'll just keep that same energy. Even though you're working on a property like Marvel, it's like, all right, uh, things are loose enough. That's a rare, I feel like most people doing a Marvel interview, it's like they have uh, several sticks up their ass at all times. Everyone seems very that's right. scared. That's right. But I knew I was leaving. And I already, <laughs> when I was talking to you, I was like, this is all a fraud. I'm a fraud. You're a fraud. I'm making you a fraud. I'm leaving in three weeks. Um, yeah, so I'm just... Did you really yeah. know that? Did you have it planned for a while? Like, this is my exit for Firaxis? Uh, oh, I, I, I didn't know it for a while. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that probably in the fall, um, I had a pretty good idea that I had something else I wanted to do. And, and as much as I loved um, Midnight Suns, I, I just was already... My mind was going down the road of, like, I think it's time for me to move on. So I did know towards the end that I was probably going to leave and start my own thing. Um, uh, okay, this is veering into an interview. So Jacob and Sarah and Haley are welcome to derail it back to normal community questions and all that stuff. But um, I, I learned something about you recently, Jake. Oh, uh, no, oh. I had no idea that you I got a hold of your internet search history. <laughs> Let's go through it together. This is what the MinMax show is all about, baby. No, I, I learned that you left uh, in the middle of XCOM 2's development to work on like another passion project for yeah. 2K. Like it. I did. So it was called I Dusk, did. and it was, was it an RTS, or what was Dusk? No, 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 it was basically Minecraft, uh, but you could craft animals. Um, so Kristoff used to run 2K, uh, he now runs Amazon Games, and he came to me and he was like, Oh, Jake, do you have anything that you... He's German. Okay, do you have cool. anything you want to work on? Do you have any big ideas? And I was like, I do. Um, so yeah, it was going to be a voxel world... And instead of like No Man's Sky, you kind of visit worlds. This one was going to be you build a world, you're kind of saving a world. Like it's desolate. You put together an ecology, you craft animals that can survive on the world. You need predators, you need prey. Um, and again, it all sounds very cool. Uh, or maybe it doesn't, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, it, I only worked on it for 10 months. It was very hard. I couldn't come up with a good design reason for why am I, you know, I don't Why am I crafting these animals, basically? Like, why am I putting rabbit ears on a fucking elephant, right? So, <laughs> wait, I forgot to ask if I can curse. I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't fine. Mean to... Do what you want. You're okay. all set. Did you ever right. play that old RTS called Impossible Creatures by chance? Of course. Okay. Of were, course. were you thinking about that a little bit in the design of this whole thing? I was. Yep, I was. I was. And so, yeah, it was fun, but the tech was very difficult. So, it didn't go very far. And then X2 wasn't going very well. And so, uh, I remember I was... I. Christoph had me come back out to California where 2K's offices were. And he was like, I don't think it's good for your career if XCOM 2 is not good. And I said, mm, I get what you're saying. It was, I was like, I copy, solid copy, Commander. I will return to X2. <laughs> so, and that was it for my, uh, for my, dream, my dream project. One of many dream projects. Every designer has about 40 dream projects. So that yeah. was one of them. 
And now you had one so good that you're like, I got to leave Fraxis and start up Midsummer Studios here? Yeah, Midsummer Studios. Uh, the funny thing about this, so we're all in office, actually. Um, and these offices, which you can see behind me, these are actually old Fraxis offices. So I, um, when I saw, when we were going looking for office space, the old Fraxis offices were available. And I was oh, like, whoa. I have to, I have to. Uh, the first guy we hired was Sid Meier's son. Right. So Ryan um, is a senior gameplay engineer for us. And so, um, yeah, I've thought about like trying to date Sid's wife. I'm just oh, trying cool. to be some, I'm single white femaling Sid at this point. So, um, yeah, but I still, this way I get to see Sid, you know, he come. I think he comes to visit me. I think it's probably his son, but, um, but yeah, it yeah. is, uh, it is kind of a trip. This is like a, a place where we all kind of start our careers. That's bizarre. Did you specifically make a note that you wanted Sid's old office or did you say like, no, nah, that's sacred ground. I couldn't possibly sit in there. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, uh, the problem is everybody comes in. I don't remember. They're very different now. So it's like, nobody can remember where they used to sit. So I don't know. I might be in Sid's old office. I could never fill his office, but, but effective. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's not get wild here. But so yeah. you left to start Midsummer studios and the yep. pitch that you're talking about is it's like a hardcore version of The Sims. When you say hardcore, okay, then, look, would you hey, mind clarifying what you mean? This is not one of Haley's mods. By the way, you are on with the right group of people because Jacob Geller is a huge fan of Marvel's Midnight Suns. Haley and Sarah are huge fans of The Sims. Uh, I'm a big fan of Sid Meier. Uh, so we're all, we're all the right audience, man. Right. Um, yeah, I, I think that, yes, this is not like wicked whims for my sims people this is not like wicked whims you know version of the sims i'm not, not that we won't support what you're talking about i don't yeah, even know what that, that is i don't know either i don't know either i i also have not played that a lot um so uh yes um no yeah the idea is that we're making a live sim but we're focused very very much on emergent storytelling so we're really really focused on injecting story into characters lives and kind of Again, I've played a lot of Sims. What I've always wanted is for the game to recognize the crazy shit that's happening, right? The relationships and when, you know, you're, I don't know, you're at a party or wherever and your wife starts flirting with like this old, you're like, what the hell is going on? All of a sudden, this crazy stuff starts happening and you want the game to kind of acknowledge that and build a storyline out of it. So we are trying to make a game that recognizes storylines, injects storylines, and allows the player to kind of steer them in whatever direction. That's got to be so tough. Um, I'd imagine Maxis went through this in the 90s of like, it's it's the perfect project for scope creep like crazy. Uh, how, do you, yeah. how do you rein that in? Well, I think that we, we kind of focus on, again, stories are razor. So we deprioritize certain things. Like a life sim could be, everything i mean i mean a life sim could be absolutely massive so instead we're like hey this is gonna be set in a small town everybody's gonna know each other you can make all the characters you can have pre-made characters we're gonna precede everybody with relationships so that everything you do is gonna come back to you in some way right everybody's somebody's best friend cousin neighbor ex-lover okay we, we set these relationships they're very important in our game so the idea is that we really focus on is it important to generating interesting story? So again, I, I've said like in the Sims, you know, you've got your biology needs, you need to go to the bathroom, but for us, we only, you are still going to go to the bathroom, but only if it helps the story, right? We always think like, is this interesting? Does this make a dramatic event, funny event, um, romantic? <laughs> the toilet is typically not involved in a romantic storylines, okay, but cool. who knows? Who am I to judge by the way? Interesting. Also, I'm not here to yuck anybody's yum. Of All right. Course, so, yeah. So, yes, it is. It is. Um, the open ended nature is is difficult, but I think you just got to stay laser focused on what you're trying to deliver for us. It's story. Yeah. It. I, so it seems like a designing games is a thousand times harder than I could possibly imagine. How confident do you have to be about that game design mm. before you before you jump out the window at Firaxis? Because I feel like, you know, you talking about the early development of XCOM Enemy Unknown, and there were so many attempts, and then you just had to scrap all the plans after a year or something oh. like that. Like, how confident were you about the design before it's like, yep, I can hinge my career on this, let's go? Uh, that, that is a good question. Um, I think that it becomes... I think I have the confidence. I, 
I think it's a case of I have I can recognize ideas that to myself I'm like I think I can do this with the tricks and tools I usually have. So I know it sounds weird, but I made XCOM and I designed Midnight Suns, um, and it seems like on its face like a small town um, uh, story generator, emergent story generator seems very different. Um, but it's not. I'm still using the same design tricks that I always had, like high stakes and give the player interesting choices and very clear trade-offs. And if you do this, you're going to get this reward, but it's very clear that there's going to be a trade-off. And so, you know, again, 30 years ago, people who made systems-driven games, which I do, guys like Will Wright, you know, or Peter Molyneux, they can make games about anything, right? They would just, they wouldn't, I make games about combat. I mean, it'd be like, I make games about railroads. I made a game with Sid about golf, for God's sake, right? Like, right. If you can make games that are fueled by systems, you can, I, I feel like you can tackle a lot of subjects. And so that's what kind of gave me the probably naive confidence, but that like, hey, this could be really fun making a game about modern life. Yeah. And you feel like uh, you've cleared some hurdles. It's a home stretch design wise. Sure. Okay, yeah. great. Uh, can I, can no, I like, ask about the, the biggest hurdle? Um, yeah. as someone yeah. who spends uh, like 20% of the time talking with my partner in Simlish, um, what is, mm. what's your approach to language? Because there's uh, that, right. that other one coming out, uh, what life by you, um, mm. that is billing itself as like, we're English. That's our big thing. And that seems incredibly hard. It is. And I will say that that is under that is, for us, that's under development. We have some really, okay cool stuff we're doing, but I think there's also Paralives, but they're doing Simlish, right? Paralives looks right. awesome, too. They're doing Simlish. Um, and then there's Inzoi, um, being made by Crafton, which is also one of our investors, which I didn't know. They announced that after they invest, and I was like, interesting. I don't care. I'll, the investment is enough. Um, so, yeah, there's... I felt like a, like a Mr. Clever when I was like, I'm going to make a life sim. I'm going to challenge the sims. And then by the time I announced I was like, holy shit. Why are they like six life sims? Like there were none <laughs> for 25 years, right? For 20 yeah. years. And I was like, I am I love the sims. I was like, this is such an underserved market. I was like, this is going to be awesome. And then now it's like, oh my God, I have to get in line behind like four other games, which look pretty good. So that's just how it goes. Yeah. What is it, Haley and Sarah? What, what, why this boom of sims likes now well, i think it's like the cycle of the people who played it are now old enough yeah and i think them. the technology's come far enough because we saw the same thing with like the harvest moon stardew valley right right For the longest time we only had harvest moon Ooh, that's a good point. And farm sims and then stardew valley hit and all of a sudden everyone's like oh we really like these let's take more of these and i'm making one and i love harvest moon right. so we're just you know it's our time now yeah, Jake, Sarah's yep. working on Fields of Mystria, which is a farming game just here. In the Fields of Mystria looks awesome. Sim. Looks very Thank awesome. I, I know of it, yes. Wow, and that I will play it because, a compliment. Yeah, I've put a ton of time into Stardew, and so, yeah, I'm mm -hmm. very excited. Uh, you ready to get to these community questions? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, great. They're going to be tough. Uh, Andreas Jensen writes in and says, Midnight Suns is one of the best and most underrated games in recent years. Oh, oh my God. Can I come on the show all the time? <laughs> that was the only nice one. Uh, yeah, was... wait for question two. <laughs> Counterpoint. <laughs> Gates of Kel writes in and says, You and the team nailed magic. With a K, the character, uh, in Marvel's Midnight Suns. They say, he was probably in my oh. top three Marvel characters, so thank you for nailing the character that I love so much. I'm excited to see what you and the new studio do next. That is awesome. So Magic is my favorite character in all of Marvel Comics. She, uh, she was the, the first comic book event. I'm a big X-Men guy, and her event called Inferno was like the first thing I read. I loved her. I, the funny thing to me is that I'll say something I haven't said before here, um, is that Magic, there are a lot of people, I, if it's pejorative to say simping, then I didn't say that. A lot of people love magic, let's say, okay? Um, a lot of people have discovered her because of the game, which I love because she's my favorite character. She was a deep cut when I when I put her in. Uh, but a lot of people are like, ah, oh, if only I could romance magic. And here's the thing, magic in, in our universe, and I believe in the comic too, is asexual. I was like, magic, there is no romance with magic. And so I, I'm like, well, I don't want to like ruin anybody's fantasies here, but it was funny because that was always a part of what we were doing writing wise. 
Um, and so now, you know, now there's all these people who are like, I love magic. If only, if only the game let me date magic. And I'd be like, no, no, I'm sorry. That is that even if we turned on dating, you would still be, you would still be sad about that. So. Yeah, more the hardcore romancing into dating, I think is what people would be yeah. going for and disappointed by. Yeah. I get it there. A lot of people think that, um, that Marvel didn't allow us to have dating in Midnight Suns, which isn't true. We just, I never, there was never an option to have dating. So I, I take the blame for that. People are like, why can't I hump Blade? And I'm like, <laughs> I would also, I look, I get it. He's the most humpable of, 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 of vampire hunters. But yeah, that was never an option. So I also want to clear that up. There's your headline right there, Ben. For the podcast, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> I gotta go with it. Yeah, sure. Who's the most the most humpable vampire hunter? I mean, I don't know. Van Helsing is also extremely humpable. Yeah, yeah, I mean that's yeah. Uh, magic was was one of my favorites just because my quickly my favorite thing in Midnight Suns to do became just kicking guys into other guys. Like that was yeah. you know once once I learned that that was kind of how the game worked is like you need to think about how you're moving enemies around the field. Then magic, that's like that's her whole bag. It's just yes. like kicking guys through portals into other guys through another portal into an exploding barrel. It was I, I think I talked about this on the podcast, but like it became one of those games where like when I was walking around in real life, I started seeing like the midnight sun's lines like projecting <laughs> yeah, away from go. things. <laughs> yeah, just don't do it in real life. Uh, yeah, it's uh <laughs> frowned upon i've I learned very gently yeah. move you over here magic was again because she's my favorite character like uh she is easily the most complicated content intensive most expensive character we made in that game by far because it was like yeah let's see portals and people teleport through these things and teleport over here right and they're like is this really should we really be doing and i was like yes yes this is worth it so yeah, doing the uh, the press rounds for announcing the new studio and stuff do is it bizarre? Do you feel like you're learning about your own career with the way people ask you questions about a game like Marvel's Midnight Suns? Or do you feel like you had a full perspective on how that game was perceived and all that stuff at, at launch? Uh, no, I mean, I think you're always, you're always learning. <laughs> I guess you're always learning. People ask you questions that, that kind of illuminate like, oh. Um, no, I mean, I think that I have a pretty good handle. I'm, I'm also, I try to be very self-aware. I don't, you know, I, I don't have much of an ego. It's hard to do this job with one. So I think I, I try to be like pretty acknowledge the things like, yeah, we did this well. We didn't do this well, you know, and I'm happy to own up to those things. Um, so and, I, you know, I, I think it it's a game I'm really, really proud of. Yeah. And so I'm definitely OK with people telling me like. I hate it and I hate you. I'm like, okay. I'm like, get in line, buddy. Behind me. All right? All right? You don't hate me more than I do. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I don't have self hate but... To, like, say that, though. Like, when you tell them you worked on a game, they'll go, oh, I didn't like that or I didn't play it. And you're like, okay. Well, like, oh, uh, okay, like, what do you want me to do about it? I'm sorry I didn't live up to your expectations. Yeah, you want to be like what they do and then see if you've read any of their stuff. Probably not. (laughs) I've never been to that bank that you work at. (laughs) I was literally thinking about this yesterday. People love to like ask, you know, what games have you worked on? And then you Mm. tell them and you're like, they're like, oh, I hated that or I didn't play that. And you're like, cool. Most people haven't. (laughs) And how hard is it? How hard is it to just like, we're not going to see each other again. Why don't you just lie to me? Right. Like, why don't you just make (laughs) a pleasant conversation and be like, that's awesome, man. You know, like I can't tell you how many times I've talked to like gaming executives and they'll be like, what did you do? And I'd be like, eh, I worked on a game called X. I'm like, I love that game. And I'm like, OK, I'm like, I appreciate that sentiment. <laughs> you definitely don't. But I appreciate it. Like basic politeness. Right. Like, where did that go? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, tech beat Nick. Diving into design stuff here, if you're okay with that for everybody here. Uh, what is something in game design that y'all think is often overlooked or underappreciated when you see people talking about games? Simple question. Something about game design that you feel like people don't talk about enough. I feel like, um, not even like, you don't have to talk about this, but I feel like map design to me is so important. Being able to open a map mm-hmm. and like clearly distinctly be able to tell where you are, what direction you're facing, right. everything going on. It just, yeah. it's so overlooked, but it's so important. Because if I'm sitting in your game and I'm opening and closing the map every five steps, like in Alan Wake, I, like Alan Wake 2, I'm going to hate it. 
It's going to ruin my life. And it's wild because, again, not knowing the first thing about game development, but it's like, in the realm of difficulty, map design seems like one of those things from the outside that's like, this is got to be on the easier end of the difficult spectrum of game development. But then you look at studios like oh, Bethesda no. releasing like Starfield or even like Tales of Kanzaro Zao, like that Metroidvania that released recently, and both just like whiffed on the map. And it's like, how is that? It, Jake, it, in like, and there are a lot of, yeah, I think that that's a very good, map design is a very good answer because the, the amount of like tortured conversations we will have about environments and like, should this be here and what color should it be and to draw the player's eyes forward. And um, yeah, I mean, it, there are hours and hours of conversations in every map that you play in a the game. There are hours of agonized conversation. And just know that if the map is good, then nobody on the development team is happy with it. Everybody hates it. Right. So you just get to the point where you're like, no one's happy. The designer doesn't like it. The environment artists don't like it. And that's when you've done it well. Right. When everybody's sad. Right. When nobody wins totally. Right. Yeah, so. uh, one of my one of my favorite maps in, in relatively recent gaming is the Elden Ring map, which is like really beautifully like illustrated. Uh, right. But it also has like if you look at it, you can actually see a cave just a drawn mm -hmm. on the map, even if right. you haven't discovered it and you're like, oh, I'm going to go do that. But one of the really interesting things about it is like, well, of course, even though it looks illustrated, it would have to change constantly through development as they like move stuff around. And even in the Elden Ring beta test, it was like a different looking map. And people, mm -hmm. because there's this whole cottage industry of like people who kind of pull every piece of souls information out there. Like there are people who compare the beta Elden Ring map to the like one that's in the game now and they're like it changed then there used to be a sea monster in the ocean here and now it's not there <laughs> anymore and like all of this little stuff that i'm sure had some reason and just to kind of like guess at like why they were making these changes in you know like the 11th hour of development elden ring is a good example of actual 3d map development that is incredible because when yeah. you play it you are constantly like baited onwards to be like, well, what is that thing? And wait, what is that down there? And wait, what is that thing? I mean, that must have been, I can't even imagine the amount of iterations they had to like, if you're riding at the bridge this way, we want to make sure this is in the right corner of the screen because the player's eyes are going to be like, oh, wait, what is that place? All right, I'm going to go to that place next. It's yeah. incredible. It's, yeah. Uh, is map design, level design your answer then, Jake? Or does something stand out to you that doesn't get uh, appreciated enough for the difficulty well, in game design? No, no, that answer was way better than mine. So, yeah, I'll <laughs> take that one. Yeah, that was my idea. Remember, we all said, I said, I feel like we're all right. saying the same thing. Is yeah. that I said map design? Right. That's I feel it. like, I don't know. Um, I was going to say elegance um, in design, which is not my strong suit. But when you play a game mechanic and it's very elegant, um, it's simple, um, which, again, not my strong suit. But um, I really appreciate games that are that like have really simple mechanics that are easy to grasp. And, and as a designer, you may feel like they're limiting, but it's that shows real strength as a designer to, for somebody to be like, I'm willing to sacrifice complexity because it'll be clearer this way. Right. I've never made that choice ever. And I've never made that sacrifice in my entire life. So are here's there, hoping one day. Are there designers that start out with the bare minimum design and work their way up? And then other people like you maybe are like, all right, I'm going to overcomplicate this. Like, you know, early in development of XCOM's reboot of like, okay, we're going to have time units and then blah, 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 blah. And then you kind of just pare it down to simplicity. There may be some. Sid is like that, actually. Yeah. He's pretty simple in his designs. I mean, a lot of times mine is um, underhanded because I'm like, uh, I'm guessing that half of this design sucks. So I'm going to put in twice as much as I need and then we'll just pare it back, you know? And also you need to prepare your producers for how much work you're doing. Right. And then you can be like, when they're like, we've got to cut something. You're like, I'm going to be a hero here, but we can cut this terrible thing I designed. Um, but just remember that because yeah, you, you, you pile too much in and then you're like, that's awful. That's awful. This one's actually not bad. So right. All right. It's like a digital, my digital, I'm digital camera design. I'm like, you can eventually get to something good if you take a thousand pictures. That's been like, you can design a thousand things. Yeah, fine. One of them will be okay. <laughs> uh, anybody else have something uh, underappreciated in game design we haven't hit on yet? Yeah, I was thinking with multiplayer games, really easy to understand and solid voice communication stuff. Like being able to group oh. up easily, 
Uh, like if you're in a group versus a party versus whatever, how does chat work when you join a game? Is it automatically put you into team chat versus group chat? What do you do? Blah, blah, blah. Like just having really, it's like, I understand how this works. There's one button I might need to flip on or off. And other than that, we're good. I appreciate multiplayer games so much when I don't have to look up a guide to how to group up with my friends. I can't stand that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Steve Bellegard writes in and says, hello, Min Max. I was playing Gears of War 4 this weekend, and the action was interrupted by the task of restoring the power to some object roughly every 20 minutes. It got me thinking, is there any one task that you have done in a game more than restore power? What other pacing tasks drive you nuts in games? I hate Probably. when they're like, you, you gotta come get the ancient artifact to save the world, and then you get to it, and they're like, oh no, it's actually in five pieces <laughs> right and right, you're right. like and then and then you get to the you go to the pieces and they're like actually this one's in also five pieces <laughs> and you're like are you like every time you get somewhere and instead of just rewarding you they just like move the goalpost it's the worst i feel feeling. like drives me insane yep i'm so obsessed with that carrot on the stick for what's driving you forward in like a narrative game and that idea is like it's gonna frustrate everybody to be like it's right here no it's not it's like it, no one's having a good time at that moment Nathan I feel Drake. like <laughs> he, he loves doing it. I, I, another very Nathan Drakey thing is like, here's the big building. Uh, front door is locked. Mm. Mm -hmm. like, there's got to be a side uh. entrance somewhere. It's, I don't necessarily mind it. But, you know, it's like restoring power is boring. Opening, a, you know, going around side to open an unlocked door. It's like fine. But it is one of those things of like. I, I guess there is just always an unlocked side door and that's what we're going to be doing or this window's open or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> kind of in the same vein is like, oh, there's the place I need to go to. Ten steps ahead. Oh my God, the earth's shaking. Oh, big crater <laughs> oh, right, right in front right. of me. Oh, I got to figure out a different way to get over there now. Are you like ready for stuff. a dark, spooky level? Okay, yeah, <laughs> all right, sure. Here we are underground. Yeah, I mean, so the, the pacing tasks, it's interesting that that's how Steve put it here because... I think as as much as I love the Final Fantasy VII remake games, like Rebirth in particular, just has so many of those. Like, why is this? Why am I using a Mako vacuum? Like, is this adding anything? But I think in their minds, it's like, well, we got to change up the pacing. We can't just have you doing combat and run around. You got to actually slow it down every once in a while because that'll We've feel better. We've developed the most fun combat system to ever put in a Final Fantasy. So right. instead, you're gonna chuck boxes as Kate sit for thirty <laughs> unbroken minutes. Right. That's right. They want you to appreciate it, right? Yeah. Don't you miss combat right now, huh? All right. <laughs> I mean, how often do you talk about that in your games there, Jake, about that idea of like, all right, we need to change up the pace every once in a while, even if it's not the most fun activity, but we know in the long run it's going to be worth it. It is true, yeah, and it's probably oftentimes a miss. So, yeah, I'm probably being quiet right now because I feel called out, right? So, um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think that, and, and sometimes like pacing, um, and, you know, I was going to talk about this a little bit later, but like sometimes those really like when they take you on a real left turn where um I, okay so how about this the uh the drunk scene in red dead redemption 2 yeah. right where you're very much surprised by something where you're like oh yeah I, I think it's gonna be this and then all of a sudden it throws me in this really fun side gameplay mechanic event whatever and you're like oh that's great like that refreshes you and you're like oh that's that's really if they do it well it's really good great to kind of break up the game and also a lot of times if the pacing of it, the uh, mechanic can break up the tone it's kind of nice too yeah um, so if you're like oh it's a little more lighthearted, uh, but if it's repetitive pacing yeah like restore power or if it's like yeah the artifact is in five pieces and also then you get there like yeah the artifact actually hasn't been here for 20 years and like <laughs> you can like email me and be like yeah no 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 don't come here like the artifact is on the is that island and you're like oh, okay great <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, it's funny because I think I, I tend to think of both the XCOMs and, and Midnight Suns as having kind of like the ultimate pacing hack where it's like you just have the two halves where like while you're in battle, you're like, oh, man, I can't wait to take all this stuff home to my base and like build a new weapon. And then when you're in the base, you're like, oh, man, I can't wait to, like, take all this stuff back into battle and use it because I couldn't. And so it's just like they're just kind of pulling you in a loop. But like every time I'm somewhere, I can't wait to get back to the other place to use what I just got, which I feel like is why I spend, you know, like hundreds of hours playing those is because I'm just getting pulled in that circle. 
Yeah, that's very true. I mean, that that is our that is basically the the one more turn, as Sid calls the the next thing, is that you always are kind of like falling. There's always this momentum pushing you back to the other. Uh, Midnight Suns was a little more controversial because if you didn't like talking to people, as I've been informed a few times on Twitter, that <laughs> some people didn't. Uh-huh. Um, but you know they were they've been very kind about it. Um, but yeah, some people didn't like. Oh, I don't want to talk to all these people. Um, and so it's interesting. In XCOM, it was kind of like, yeah, just do the fiddly stuff, do your research, get your toys, and then when you get a bunch of toys, you're like, yeah, man, I'm ready to go back out there. So that was a very tight loop. Midnight Suns was a little looser because it was more narrative of like, hey, now you're back at the hub. Do you want to talk about it? Um, and so yeah, some people would probably view that as a pace change. Some people liked it. I think a lot of people liked it, but. Some people, apparently, they didn't. So, what are you going to do? Chandler writes in to say, Hey, and Max, I'm excited about your guest. That's you, Jake. Uh, They said, Can you ask Jake what his favorite XCOM-like game is? XCOM's the gold standard for me, so I'd love to hear what games he loves that clearly have been inspired by XCOM. Your version of XCOM. Uh, So, I do not play... If if something is has this is not a philosophical thing, but if something is like an XCOM like or something, if it's clearly an XCOM like, I've I've never played those games. I've never played Phoenix Point or any of those games. Not because I feel there's anything wrong with it. It's just too much. Like it just is not not. It just doesn't sound fun to me. The one game that I've played that they said they were inspired by XCOM, I don't even want to even come close to taking credit for this game. Though was um into the breach. Because right. I love that game. I don't really see the XCOM stuff, but um, I saw somewhere they told a friend of mine, they're like, oh, yeah, we were inspired by XCOM. I was like, really? And I was like, okay, I'll put that on my resume. Uh, because <laughs> Into the Breach is incredible. I don't really see the XCOM stuff there. And I, I, I love that game. I think mean, when I talk about elegance, that's the kind of design I'm talking about. So that would be the one. I mean, anything else, I, I think it's very hard to say unless they specifically have said, like, yeah, we were inspired by XCOM because, yeah. But yeah, I mean, turn based combat's been around for a long time. Um, so, like, yeah. My, I, Mario and Rabbids is like, you know, the big example. Like, he didn't check out. Oh, like, sure, sure, sure. Like, Sparks of Hope. I actually did play Mario and Rabbids. And I okay. thought I, the first one, and I thought that was really, they were very clever with like movement. They did a lot of really cool stuff with movement. They made it simpler in terms of like shot percentages. I remember really liking that game. So, yeah, that was cool. Okay, right on. Yeah, actually, um, there's a game coming out. Oh, wait. Out. What? Weren't you, I was that E3 when they were announced. Wasn't I with you? I was like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was yeah. on a is demo that- with like uh, Arthur Parsons and. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, good memory. Yeah, that was like you reacting to the reveal trailer for Mario and Rabbids that uh, the internet really enjoyed because you were impersonating the French developers talking about Luigi's in half cover, as I think you put yeah. it. <laughs> uh, yeah, sometimes I make poor choices. All right. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's good. Um, Villas writes in and says, uh, for Jake Solomon, um, in this world where Baldur's Gate 3 has smashed D&D back into the video gaming space. Do you see a potential for a Dungeons and Dragons XCOM type game where you're repelling mind flayers and other extra extra planar fantasy entities? Is that how you would say that, Sarah? So mind flayers and that sounds a lot like Baldur's Gate to me. I don't know. Um, yeah. <laughs> Are you asking for Baldur's Gate 4? Um, I think so. uh, Sure, of course. I, I think, of course, it could work. Classes um, and turn-based combat and a hub. I There was a while, uh, Garth DeAngelis, he works at Blizzard now, but he was my EP for the longest time on all the XCOMs and Midnight Suns. Um, and he loved dark fantasy. Um, and I did too. And for a while, we kind of toyed with the idea of a fantasy um, XCOM-like, um, where it was dark fantasy, so it was against, you know... Uh, werewolves and undead and um, uh, vampires. And then the idea is that you'd go back to a, I don't know how many people, under, I don't know how many people know Gormenghast. Does anybody know Gormenghast? So this old novel about this like ramshackle castle that goes on forever. Yeah, this is real. Like, all right, this is going to make me sound more culture than I actually am, but it's one of my favorite books. Um, and it's just like a castle that goes on forever. And I kind of like the idea of you, Going out, finding these things, coming back to this castle that itself kind of went on forever and had its own mysteries to it. And I I think I was inspired like Symphony of the Night and and all, you know, these games where you went out, you fought things, you came back. 
Um, and then you were exploring your own castle and kind of converting parts of it, but you had to conquer parts of the castle to convert it. And again, designers have a hundred dream games. That's another one of ours that, that I had and, and uh, never got made. But yes, yeah. D&D could work for sure. How much does that cost? How much does Wizards of the Coast cost? You know, probably they're probably not cheap. So I mean, Larian said that they don't want to make Baldur's Gate four. So if Midsummer wants to step up and reach out, I'm sure you can line <laughs> something up there. That's right. Well, yeah, sure. Give me a call, Laren, if you need a. No, no, no. I'm making a. I'm making a live sim now. I wish sometimes, you know, is it? I'm not a DC guy. I'm a Marvel guy. Is it Doctor Manhattan? Right. Uh huh. Yeah, I can like split into like. I don't even know if that's true to the comics, right? I just saw the. Wait, no, I'm, I'm thinking of, it's like, oh, what's of DC? Yeah, I'm it's thinking still, of Watchmen, still, right? Yeah, DC, so, yeah. you know, he splits into like 10 versions of himself. I really wish I could do that. Um, and also just go everywhere nude, right? I, th- I think that's also part okay. of his thing, right? Is he's just, um, but like able to do like 10 things at once. How great would that be? Like if you could work on 10 ideas at once. Oh, awesome. <laughs> hope for a hit rate of, you know, like 60%, you know, like <laughs> the four of you that are sad, you know, they're like, I'm a failure. You're like, no, no, talk to the other six. They're fine. We're all, we're fine. We're fine. Well, there's a game, the four that are bad at you will group up and, f- oh wait, that's altars probably. Yeah, I mean, think the, the 11 bits work in that. It's called the altars. Yeah. But, um, Pete yeah. Rion's asking, yeah, did you have a dream license that you'd love to work on that you never got to? You got to work on Marvel. That's fantastic. Okay. So Marvel, that, that was kind of my dream. I'm not a Lord of the Rings guy. I, I probably mm. shouldn't say stuff like this in case I get desperate in my old age. And then I'm like, this has always been the greatest passion of mine, Lord of the Rings. People are Chris Pratt, this video it's always been be a like, dream of mine to play Mario. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, is it? Um, all right. So, all right. Everybody's cool here, right? Okay. We're yeah, cool. Sure. Um, I... Had the license that I would like to work on, I'll just say the game that I've often thought about making is called Messiah. All right. It's set in the Holy Land. Oh, I'm interested. Um, at, you know, Roman controlled, or maybe I'd have to have a, you know, fictional uh, uh, imperial army controls a, uh, but the Holy Land, the idea of playing the role of a potential Messiah and the idea of like, multiple forces i think about i mean geez again i'm I'm going pretty far here but you know there's like this moment the garden of gethsemane and, and and jesus has all this doubt and he says like you know take this cup away from me but you know if it be your will and i love that doubt and you're like what if you played the person you're like are you actually a messiah like are you like truly doing that is there's angels there's demons there's prophecy there's like roman legions you have followers i just think that's a very rich you could never make this game i want to be really clear this game <laughs> well could never i don't know be i've made. heard of a little game called i am jesus christ demo mm-hmm. available on steam now <laughs> yes i think that there's if you go like straight at it and you're like we're making a like you know this one this is great this is the story you're just playing through the story i love the idea of like an ambiguous like you're playing The system, there's like systems, again, I'm a systems guy, where it's like, well, I don't know, what is your story? What is your Messiah story? And it's, you know, again, you could never make it. I was raised very, very Catholic. Okay. Uh, I have a lot of shit to work through. Okay, (laughs) obviously, right? But I would like angels, demons, like the, the ability to like make decisions and work through that. That's my dream IP that I'm never going to touch. I'm just going to, I mean, unless I get so rich that I'm like Howard (laughs) Hughes level, like (laughs) the Holy Ghost. Well, I think yeah. well, I think we can tie it back to earlier in the episode. You could get that VeggieTales IP license, Jake. Oh, yeah. That is the perfect <laughs> oh, fit for this. I thought I did a cheeseburger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could do that. <laughs> done, done. Yeah. I feel like it's the kind of game that I'll work on for 15 years. Nobody will ever see, right? Yeah. And I will just mysteriously, I'll just die mysteriously, right? And, like, at the end, his fingernails were two feet long. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's so the game that can't be made. So yeah, <laughs> I would love to take on uh, that as a game concept because it's a very powerful. It's got everything you want. <laughs> it's, got, it's got everything you want though. It's got like huge <laughs> emotional baggage, right? right? Multiple interesting factions, right? And then the idea of playing through it. 
um, you would get, I believe, a fair amount of press, uh, you know, and if they say all, all press is good press, well, then you're going to get a lot of good press. Um, and so I just think it'd be really, really interesting as a designer to think like, how am I going to make this game interesting and let players find their way through this? And like, how did yours end up? You know? Yeah. What the, do you, have you done many game jams in your life? It feels like you got so many ideas. No. Wouldn't it just be fun just to spend two days working on your Messiah game and get it out there and say, okay, that's out of my system. I don't have to think about this anymore. <laughs> Make that game in two days. Yeah, I don't think that's like a well, two-day game. Look, well, look, it's a game jam. Well, seven, so, you know. <laughs> yeah. Hey, there we go. So we got a timeline. Yeah, it's a, it's a game jam two days. You know, it'd be a super crude version, yeah. though, just to it's get something pixel. out of it. Yeah, I mean, mine would end up as, yeah, you just have to turn it into, like, a fighter, you know? Like, it's a side-scroller. It's just okay. a bunch of, like, Roman centurions coming at you, like, <laughs> Like, I feel like this is pretty disrespectful. Yeah, it could so. be. Hey, Travis and Fargo has a question. Um, they say, hey, is it ever okay to tell someone you had a dream about them? Or is it weird 100% of the time to tell them that? I, um, I'm curious of everyone's take on this, because I don't know. I don't know. Ben, <laughs> I, was, I was curious if Kyle Hilliard sent in this question, because he literally oh, told no. me yesterday that he had a dream about Okay, me. but genuinely, genuinely, scale of 1 to 10, Kyle's not going to listen to this. How intrigued or interested were you in him telling you that? Because that will be the I, answer to this question. <laughs> I like, I mean, he said, he started it by saying, explaining your dreams to other people is always boring and correct, annoying, but correct. I'm going to do it anyway. Um, and apparently it was, I'm just going to read this because I'm sure he's fine with me sharing did it. Did he DM you this? Yes, Out he of did. the blue? Uh -huh. Did he dream about you? Yeah, he said, I had a vivid Instant dream block. last night that you wrote and financed a low-budget play about the Incredible Hulk, and you cast me to be Bruce Banner, and you were the Hulk. Uh, the weird <laughs> thing about the dream was the second performance, I had forgotten all my lines because I assumed we were done in the first performance. Uh, and so that was his dream about me, and I enjoyed you enjoyed it. that. Yeah, but, but let's it's psychologically deconstruct that. Kyle's nervous to talk around you because yeah. he forgot his lines in the play. And he was trying mm -hmm. to figure out what the Hulk had to do with it. Uh, I think I think the the positive thing about this is that I know Kyle pretty well and I've never felt any sort of uh, romantic pressure from him. And I think if that's even huh. like a 1% factor, you cannot tell people that you had dreams about Because it's just implying my brain can't stop thinking about you even when I'm not yeah. conscious. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, I think I've gotten Same. more and more in the camp of like, just don't tell anybody. Like, it would have to be the funniest damn dream ever because even then I feel like it's not passing the threshold. It's always a little bit odd. I think you gotta just leave it mysterious. You just gotta be like... Had a dream about you last night. That's the worst thing you could do. <laughs> like, That's just the worst thing you could do. As hell. They're like, what? You're like, don't elaborate. Don't elaborate at all. Just get your coffee and be like, all right, soldier. See that, you later. That's how you should you know? start then, every every press interview for the new studio. Just open with right? that and then never explain it. <laughs> right. It's a really bold new thing. Oh, it's good to see you again. Had a dream about you last night. <laughs> anyway, let's move on to the game. Yeah, Sid Meier, <laughs> a really inspirational figure in my life. Let me count down yeah. the ways. <laughs> Hey, are y'all like really crazy dreamers? Do you dream oh yeah. every night? Oh yeah. Yeah? Oh yeah. Big time. What percentage of the cohorts have you had a dream about? <laughs> oh, great oh, now you're question. soliciting him to tell. You don't have to yeah. say who. <laughs> I, I can't think of a specific dream memory, but I bet I've dreamt about 60% of you. Okay. But only the cool ones. Um, oh. <laughs> and it's always just us so going it's on Jeff a cool... So like 300 times <laughs> yeah, and the rest exactly. of us have showed up one. <laughs> going Jeff moose hunting with Jeff. Jeff is so on that list. Are you kidding me? He's probably... probably the, it's a safer bet. More than yeah. your wife. <laughs> you said Shh, don't tell her that. <laughs> you see, she can hear me probably, but my wife is like, she loves when I tell her stories about like, oh, I dreamed about you last night. Like she's enthralled by that. So that's like the one area of my life where it's like, okay, I should keep relaying those boring stories because she seems to be amused by them. Because I, I dream about people if I talk to them that day. Like I don't really view it as like a, I'm thinking about them so crazy. I think my subconscious <laughs> is just so full of stress and annoyed. Like, like it just bombs at me when I go to bed. Yeah, no, that's right. That's what uh, sleeping's for. You get the idea. Bomb. Straight bomb. Uh, Derek writes in, says, with everything going on in the industry, uh, do you think we'll ever see the day... This is a hard pivot, sorry. Do you think we'll ever see the day where a AAA developer makes a Patreon to help sustain themselves? Game funding through Patreon. AAA? Yeah, AAA is an odd no. choice. 
No. <laughs> Double A, no. Like, uh, no. No, you know. I, I think Patreon's awesome. Uh, I mean, Triple A's got an interesting challenge. I mean, yeah, Triple A. What do, Speaking what, of somebody who came from, like, a Patreon, I mean, is the world contributing per month? <laughs> like, is the world a subscriber to whatever podcast you're doing? Because it's a very expensive proposition. Okay, so I mean, when you're going around pitching your new game, do you assign yeah. it an A number? <laughs> like, do you, Is it obligated for you to be like, well, it's double A or triple A? Uh. No, but I think you think of, I think you think of what the price point is, what you're targeting. And so it's an interesting time, right? You've got your quadruple A's, right? You've got your, you play a game like Spider-Man, the Sony, the Sony games are kind of like the, you know, I was thinking of the, the, uh, as the like, quadruple a games right yeah uh, i don't know god of war or forbidden or, or um uh, uh horizon spider-man 2 horizon yeah. um um and uh, last of us right so those games are quadruple a rockstar quadruple a and they charge 70 dollars, and you're like sure right i call it the handshake right the players and the developer make handshake and the player goes like oh my god that was that feels like it's worth a lot more and the developer goes like, wow, I, that's going to be great for us that you paid this amount of money. Um, and 70, I don't know why it feels like so much, but it does, right? And um, compared to the, re, the, you know, the relative history of games. And so if Spider-Man 2 is like $70, then you're like, holy shit, right? Like you're making a game you're like, oh, well, how about 70 for ours? And they're like, that's a lot of money. And you're like, all right, fair enough. So you get your quadruple A's and then you've got your double A's like that are still great, right? Like um, uh, Hell Dives and Pal World and Manor Lords where people are like, yeah, I'm not looking for the Spider-Man 2 effect of like you play and you go like, this is better than a movie. This is incredible. I can feel the production quality in this thing. Yeah. Um, so I think AAA is in a really difficult spot that I don't have any smart answers for. But yeah, I think you think, yeah, we're going to, and again, we're, we're already saying we're going to be mid premium. Like we're just not going to target that AAA price point because that's just a tough spot to be in right now. Yeah. And Jacob, uh, you, that, you agree that the Patreon idea is just right out? Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's like the, the game developers that I have seen on Patreon, because it's actually kind of an interesting sub niche are like, people who are making a very impressive mod for an existing game. You know, it's like I support a guy on Patreon who's doing like a Dark Souls 2 overhaul. And I'm like, that looks really cool. You're the only person on this. It's probably going to take you years to do, you know, like that's okay. But it's yeah. like as soon, even even games that were kickstarted at the height of game kickstarters, like that Kickstarter money didn't actually take them to the finish line. No. You know, like it just kind of helped convince other publishers to fund them. And I think there's no way that you could have like more than five people working on a game. Even five, you would have to be at like an enormous Patreon level to be able to like pay them a reasonable amount every month. Yeah, uh, we're, we're talking so Gerstman I, levels. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. The, um, you know. I think that there is a life sim being made paralyzed, which looks awesome. Um, and it's they Patreon is a big part of what they're doing. I think that's how they're supporting themselves. It's a team of 15. And so again, I don't know the, I wouldn't even dare speak to the economics of another team, but that's got, it's just gotta be tough. Right? Like Patreon, the numbers and yeah, Kickstarter is a good point of like, they sound like big numbers and it's not about, that's the thing is you want to be like, it is not about people having nice things. It's about like, it's just things are so expensive, right? To run the dev house that you're not paying anybody a ton of money. It's just a case of like, there are a lot of disciplines that are required to make a game like any, at any level of quality. There's a lot of people required to make a game and then that that all that cost stacks up and so i think patreon can work for i definitely believe it can work for certain types of games if they made the right choices on if they can be what what is called capital efficient right if they make certain choices like yeah we we do not that this is necessarily cheaper but they choose an art style where it's like this is a little bit more efficient to make and sure we can limit the number of people that we have on our team and but all these choices of 
the minute you start to add features that people start to expect at a certain price level, it's like, oh, yeah, that adds 10 people to our team. And I don't know how you even do that without a lot you of know, money. There, there is a counter to everything that we've just said, which is the game Star Citizen that does sure. kind of exist and has raised five hundred million dollars yeah. from crowdfunding essentially yeah. yep. and it's like that is I, I don't think there will ever be a star citizen again that has kind of been developed in the same way as that but like that is a I, it's got private funding as well but yeah. like that is an insane amount of money that's more than the development budget of spider-man 2 um you know, and and so like for some reason that one works, but it's because they're selling people like digital plots of land on Mars within Star Citizen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Taylor Walker watched us live says, what's the average budget for a triple A game? Like from what we know on this side of the fence, it seems like anywhere from 100 to 300 million dollars. Well, I Haley mean, posted about this literally today. Yeah, in the today. Slack. Yeah. It's like, yeah, uh, Ben, did you from... read our Slack? Well, I didn't know if Haley wanted to reveal that. Uh, it's up to her. <laughs> I, but she didn't say anything. Yeah, I just made it up. <laughs> no, it was a uh, redacted publisher. But like, I look at these kind of agreements a lot. So it's really interesting to see when the publisher is defining things, right? Because they're it's their agreement precedent. We're just going to sign it. And they're saying, well, you're not allowed to work with another AAA studio to make a AAA game. And they define those two things. I'm always like, oh, what do they? What do they think that is? And it's almost always tied to budget, which. I think as long as you're talking more than like 10, 20 mil, that could yeah. be considered triple A. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I would say, yeah, I, I would view it as, as a developer, I view it as like triple A. And again, that, that works from a legal standpoint, but I think that, yeah, when you start talking triple A, not quadruple A, but like triple A, I think you're looking at like 80, 90, hundred. I mean, like you're definitely looking at like getting close to a hundred million, which is why it's in a tough spot as costs go up. And everybody's like, yeah, I want community features and I want all these things, which are totally reasonable because the quadruple games are kind of pushing the bar higher and higher and higher. And it's like, and I want this narrative and I want this things and it's, it's perfectly fine. But all those things like, yeah, your costs are they're running up to 100 million for sure. So with your game, you don't have to get into too many specifics here, but you have like a team of 10 at Midsummer, somewhere around there? Mm-hmm. Okay. We're, we'll be 12 in a month or so. Yeah. Okay, right on. And so you just locked that down and then you went around to investors and said, hey, make the bet. And how was that process for you? Um, it was tough because funding, I mean, it's a rough environment for games right now. And before all the horrific layoffs started, funding dries up. That's the first thing that happens. It's like funding for new stuff dries up and then funding for existing stuff dries up. Um, so we're really fortunate to to find investors. So we were venture capital backed, which is what I wanted. I didn't want to do a publisher deal this early. Um, I kind of wanted to have that independent control of what we're doing. Um, and so it was tough though. It was, you have to find investors that see the vision and go like, yeah, I can see how you're gonna turn this into something successful. Um, and so, yeah, and it's interesting because a lot of times you, investors have an understanding of games. If, if they're successful, they understand games, they understand, but they're also, they're business people, right? Even more so than publishers, they are like, I have to see how this investment turns into a return, right? You have to explain the business. And as developers, you're much more on the art side where you're like, but my vision, you know, but my dream, you know, they don't want to hear that. And rightfully so. They're not, they're like, I don't, I'm not talking about your dream. I'm talking about who are you selling this to? Like, how can you tell me there's a market for this thing? So it was interesting. Um, I was kind of naive. I think I kind of left Fraxis and was like, all right, who wants a piece of the Jake man? <laughs> and it was like, it was like, who the hell are you? Like this, none of this works. And I was like, oh no. Oh, I've made a terrible mistake. What, what, um, what so, is yeah. step one of that process? Do you have like an agent? Are you just cold calling publishers and saying, uh, XCOM? I, I actually had an, I actually had an agent, right? So I had an agent, you have lawyers. Um, and so they are, they know everybody who knows everybody. And you start having conversations with people. And there's a lot of people. I met a lot of great people. We were lucky to be in a situation where we're, I'm, Sure, we were one of the very few people new studios funded last year, but um, we had awesome. Our investors are called Transcend, our lead investors, and they're 
Yeah, you know, a funny thing is actually Trevor Noah is one of our investors. His movie production house is one of our investors, isn't it? <laughs> that, that's bizarre. So you never know where it's going to come from. He loves um, the Sims. <laughs> right. So he's all in. So, yeah, it, it's, it's interesting. You have to meet with a lot of people, but you meet with – everybody has different – as investors, they have different things they want. And there were some people who were like, yeah, I've been waiting for – they recognize that, again, I'm, I have a, a very – you know, I have a very clear vision of what I want as a design and an artistic vision of this product. But there are people who recognize, hey, life sims are like maybe the last blue ocean in games where they're like, the audience is massive. Nobody is serving them. OK, now there's like seven people serving them. But at the time, they were like, why is nobody serving this underserved, massive, loyal audience? And there are good reasons why. But um, yeah, so it was. It was meeting people that understood, that kind of understood that. They were like, yeah, we've been waiting for a pitch like this. Yeah. So you didn't want to sign up with a publisher. Was there pressure to do that? Like what what uh, direction were the winds of the industry trying to push you that you were fighting against? No, no. I mean, there wasn't pressure. I mean, there were, you know, you just, I think that it's a, a choice you make. I mean, it's just, a, and it's, you know, there's pros and cons, right? If you, if you sign with a publisher, that's, it's, they're not, you know, they, they don't, and they don't take, uh, typically they don't take equity out of your company, right? They don't, you know, it's not a trade, but it's also not money up front. Like venture capital is money up front. They're like, yeah, equity in your company is a trade for money up front, not tied to milestones. It's like, here's the money, put it in the bank. It's yours now, right? And now their job is, as venture capitalists is to be like, you have our money. In fact, it's your money. It's not my money anymore. I have shares in your company. I need to do everything I can to help you now because otherwise I've just thrown my money down. It's a really great relationship because they're like, Hey, I actually do think it's, it's a more positive relationship because you can be like, look, I have this artistic vision, the venture capitalists, they understand games, but they're like, this is a business proposition and we have invested in you. And it is our job now to get you to where you need to go because you, you have the money now. Yeah. And you can also say like, we have the money up front. Publishers is more like it's tied to milestones. It's tied to whatever their financial outlook is. And if they want to say like, oh, yeah, we're not. We've changed our ideas. And it's like they can just at any time be like, yeah, we're not doing this anymore. And so not being in that position, I think, has been great for us to start. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that we won't partner with somebody down the line. We may. But it just was a it just really was the way we wanted to start this. Gotcha. Uh, Graham Jones writes in and says, hey, this is a question for Sarah. What are your investment strategies? No, um, what are your thoughts on the new <laughs> Lord of the Rings Animal Crossing-like game called Tales of the Shire? I want to oh I, I have voted this. I want to hear Sarah's take on it. <laughs> Guys, I... It looks super cute, right? It's super adorable. You're in your little, like, glen, very cottage core. I cannot get past those fugly feet on the hobbits. <laughs> I hate them. They disgust me. <laughs> I literally, I, they showed the trailer and yeah. they zoomed in on the feet. I'm sorry, ruined 100% cannot play. What like, if... imagine trying to live your best cottagecore life <laughs> and your giant hairy carpet grippers <laughs> just frogging around in a meadow. Disgusting. What, what if, if you... they had shoes? Yeah. What if they had shoe What carpet? if the hobbits wore shoes? I know that the, the whole hobbits, like, Blast they wear shoes, blah, 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 blah. blah. <laughs> Blast so for me. Gross. Do you think? I don't know. Me thinks thou dost protest too much. I think so. <laughs> like a little patch That's of like think. hair. <laughs> Dude, is a it a little patch of hair on them? Would it genuinely would Lord of the Rings fans riot in the street if they put a sneaker oh on? God. I think so. Yeah, I think it's like a very <laughs> really? big. Faux pas. I didn't know this was a thing. Yeah, no, yeah. the hobbits uh, never wear shoes. No, that would be that would be the top headline on multiple. <laughs> Can you imagine the Reddit threads of being like, they clearly do not understand the source material in the Cimmerillion. They made clear the hobbits never wear shoes. It's like Gandalf shaving his beard. It's like you can do it, but everyone's going to be mad. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Not even as an option. Not like default, but option. Everybody would bet right now that there's no option to cover up those hobbit feet. I I might take that. I bet really safely and solidly that they will have no feet coverings in the Shire game. It's okay. just really okay. jarring because like everything's so cute and soft and skippy in the meadow with the butterflies, yeah. and then it's like giant 
hairy feet. <laughs> it feels like a nightmare to me. If it didn't have the patch, would you be okay? Because I know it's the patch, right? I, it's think, it's, I think if it mm. didn't have the weird like pubic patch on it, I could move past it. <laughs> we were all but thinking it was slightly it pubic. Literally, I, it literally, I... All mm-mm. thinking it. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the, what they should do is go all in and the audio is like, yeah, it's a very cute, like you're in the shower, yeah. but every time you're running, it's just heavy feet sounds. Just slap, 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 slap. It's just... Thumping like shaking with every footstep, and you're like, "Oh, come on!" <laughs> Is it first or third person? Because this could change how third often you have to person, see this, right? Yeah, it's gotta be third, right? Yeah, it's third. gotta be right. Yeah. Darn, I was gonna say, I just can't. First, I'm you just sorry, don't like, look down. I can't. I need like a like a, the arachnophobia mods where it gets rid of the spiders. Just like blur out all the feet. I th- it could happen. I bet someone. Oh, that feels down. even worse if you look down. It's blurred feet. Just pick something like it's just like something <laughs> else. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Joshua in today's feet economy, was yeah. that the right idea? Like in today's world of like wiki feet, like was that the play? Feet economy. Anyways. Wait, what do you mean? Yeah, they're leaning into feet more. You're saying it's not the right play? Yeah. It's just not I'm your just saying, it's right not play. your vibe. Feet. We have a society have shifted away from open toed shoes to closed toed shoes so quickly in the past fifty years. <laughs> we have? Very quickly. Like right. I'm just saying. For and there's word. a reason for that. And these have been the worst 50. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Why are houses so expensive now? Probably. Yeah. Probably I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Or is it related? Correlation mm-hmm. or causation? Mm-hmm. Let's discuss. Joshua Navalis says, if you could take one game mechanic and transplant it into another game, what would it be, Jake? Uh, karaoke from Yakuza. No, I, I, I don't know. I, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really like perfect every dancer, game. perfect dancer. In the Shire. Yeah. You win in Min Max. You just won. <laughs> I, I do think it's a case of, and I talked about this early, like the the really fun, like where they go. And obviously Yakuza is like all fun. Like they'll be like, yeah, please don't take this too seriously. But I love when games, and it's a massive investment, so it's typically never worth it. But, um, like when games are like, no, 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 this is a total side, fun, funny quest. It's well written and it is like this spark of humor that you remember as well as anything else in the game. Like that, I mean, I'm always really impressed when people do it. No, not to keep talking about Final Fantasy VII Rebirth endlessly, but that's min max, I guess. But it is it is amazing to me. So we do these huge game club discussions where we podcasted about Rebirth for 23 hours. Um, and we like break it up into a multi-part game club discussion and we have hundreds and hundreds of people from the community writing in about what they want to talk about, you know, and always the most common comment for all those sections is just a weird, lighthearted, jokey moment. Like it, for all of our game clubs, people just focus on that. It just pops so much more. No one's writing in talking yeah. about the big picture plot or how the artifact was separated into five different artifacts. Like everyone just wants to talk about like, oh my God. When Yuffie sang that song, that was my favorite part. You know, it's just amazing how much that strikes a chord. The moments when games, like, are willing to, like, stop being so goddamn serious. Like, right. when they, like, show that the games can be everything, right? Yeah. Games don't have to be this one thing that we have to find and are very successful, and so we're all afraid to break out. But, like, when games are willing to be, like, games can also, even this game you're playing can be, it can be this create something beautiful it can be something sweet it can be something funny it can be all of those things like that's a really cool moment that shows why the medium i think is of games is like extremely powerful right and there's no mission in XCOM where you like drop in and just go to a bar or something right that's that's all of midnight suns it is at midnight suns yeah it is yeah <laughs> yeah that's right it's all of midnight suns uh, Res- um, oh, sorry, Jacob. Oh, wait. No, I, have a, I have a different answer, which Please. is just in the Bayonetta games, she can turn into a cougar and she can run at like 80 miles an hour. <laughs> and it's like it's so fast that it like basically breaks any level. And it's like any game Final Fantasy 16 making me walk around that goddamn base, which is so big. <laughs> and he never goes faster than like a light jog. I was yeah. like, let me just turn into a cat and run through this. At and everyone miles is as hour. far away as possible. No one is ever They're right next to you. They're all in separate corners. They're in the most yeah. remote location. It's perfect. Even like Bayonetta Origins is also really good at that because it's all about like that weird shadowy figure that's controlled with the right stick. And if you aim that the direction you're walking, you go like three times as fast. And it's like, oh, it's just nice to have like an in-universe reason for why she can just hoof it around this world. But uh, minus the division cover system in any shooter. Division cover. Ever. Yeah, the cover system where you how you duck behind stuff when you're running forward. It's the best. It's never been improved, and I don't know why 
it's not used in every other shooter ever made. What, what is what separates it? What's unique there? It just it's automatically just so backs it? natural. Like you know how in a lot of Call of Duty's, it's like it's like hover and you like go against the piece of wood and you're just kind of like. But this one, it really feels like any piece that you come up to, you can pre-plan it, like see almost like a little arc of where you want to go, press it, and there's always a natural animation that just flows to the exact position you want to be in. And you can just do that all over the place and always have the thought of yeah. where you want to go and presuppose your character to run there. And I, what, I played that game 12 years ago? More of that. Where is that? <laughs> no one does it. Resnet writes in, says, hey, everybody, uh, a question mostly for Jake, but please feel free to jump in. Uh, does your game design work affect how you design or structure your own, your own personal life in any fun or unexpected ways? Are you game designing your life, Jake? <clears throat> well, um, the way it's interesting. I, I have a very, I, I do have a structure to my life, but it is a very boring one, which is that like I have 20 of these shirts. Smart, right? smart. I virtually never wear anything else, right? My my truck is 15 years old. Like my, I've been married for 23 years. I worked at Frax for 20 years. Like I basically am like, all right, once I find something, I'm like, that's it. Close the book on it, right? Like that is, that decision is now made and there shall never be another. So I'm like, this shirt is fine. I will now, my wife thinks it's hilarious because then I'll, it'll just be like a stack of 20 things. It'll just be like, oh my God, it's a new thing. And I'm like, yes. These jeans are pleasant. I have bought <laughs> 10 of them. And for the next seven years, these are my jeans. And I will, and you, yeah. So I try to minimize uh, decisions, which isn't any kind of new or, in, in, you know, incredible thought. But I do kind of like minimize decisions so in my life to where it's like, once I find something, I'm like, that's it. No more wondering about like, could this be better? I'm like, this is good. Good is good. So elegance in fashion, but not game design. That's your philosophy? Yes, I aspire to elegance. I have found it in my, I don't know if elegance is Elegance right in the design me, of your closet rather than the actual simplicity. clothes. Yeah. yeah, simplicity. We'll go with that. Oh, yeah. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Um, I got a question for you, Jake. Now that you're an independent man, uh, I've always wanted to ask somebody from Fraxis this. And I want to preface this by saying, I'm not saying that we're all going to overthrow the United States government. However, oh. my question for you is... Uh, no, no. Do you but we're not not going to overthrow the United <laughs> States right, government. Right, okay. Don't you think that if you just picked out four <laughs> random designers at Firaxis, you could come up mm -hmm. with a better system of checks and balances or a government for the United States than we have currently? Uh, the problem is that I tried to make it fun. Right? This is the problem. <laughs> it's not I wouldn't be designing a fair system. I'd be like, all right. right. And by the way, Donald Trump is a designer's dream. I'm like, yes, this guy. I'm like, you know. He's you, having a ball. Yes, you want to be like, he's returned. You'd be like, all right, he's gone now. And I'd be like, no, no, version two. Ooh, game design, right? It's and actually really close to real life. Wait a minute. Yeah, are, we exactly. are we living in the Sims? You'd be like, all right. Hit, hit, I often help. feel that way. Yeah, hit point bar is empty, then it's like, ba boom. <laughs> and then if you thought I was gone, foolish. Everyone says I'm the best final boss. You had low energy, I'm back. Yeah. Where's Jake? Um, so, yeah, I think the problem would be that I would design a system where it would be like, you'd be like, you'd feel like you're on a razor's edge the whole time. You're like, we are real close. And maybe okay. that's where we are, right? But okay, you get maybe they've done a great gaming job where you're like, but we won the popular vote, and it's like, oh, boom. <laughs> Player two wins, actually. Okay. Sorry, Electoral College. But if you're not just focused on fun, you get, pick the least fun designers of Praxis. I mean, you think of, like, the Founding Fathers. Oh, yeah, I've they're... got a list. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, kidding, no, kidding, but kidding. don't you think of, like, the Founding Fathers, they're just, they're, to some extent, they're systems designers, you know? Like, isn't there... Yeah. Don't, do you ever think about that idea as a designer? Is there anybody at Praxis who always is talking about, like, you know... If you structure Congress like this, it'll actually be a lot more efficient, and we incentivize people this way. I I think about that stuff all the time, but I'd have to imagine with the designer's mind. I no, I, I always think I only get pulled in on games when it's like there's a game, or my kids are playing a game, or I'm watching sports, and I'm like, I don't like this element. To at one time, I did a, I did a my maybe my favorite interview was um, they. They asked me and a bunch of former like Madden devs, like, how do we fix, 
you know, um, overtime at college football. Yeah, and I was it. like, yes. That I get invested in. Where I'm like, how can I make this the most interesting, dramatic, gamified thing possible? When you're like, how, please design a fair system for people. I'm like, what the I don't know how to do that. I'm not, I'm not interested in that at all. I'm like, maximum drama, surprise, twist endings. And I don't think I could actually do better than the Founding Fathers did. So, okay. yeah, we've had a lot of surprise and twist endings. And that's just, you know. So I guess, all right, I tried. I tried, America. Um, Ollie Clay writes in and they said, hey, everybody, what moment from your life do you wish you had a photo of? Something with great emotion attached or maybe just proof that you did an unbelievable <laughs> trick shot? Yeah, I guess you have to do a cool trick thing to make it work. Um, this is, I, I th- thumbs this one up just because it's a Minnesota story uh, for me. As one time when I was visiting my grandma in Minnesota uh, in at Christmas, and so it was very snowy, um, we had gone to like a local school where there was a hill that you could sled on, uh, and someone had made like a three foot snow jump, like a, just a ramp. And and without really thinking about it as like an eight year old, I went off and got so much air that it was the first time in my life that I had ever had the wind knocked out of me. Like I landed yeah. and it was just like, I'm like, couldn't <laughs> breathe. But like, I imagine if you took a picture when I was flying off that ramp, Ooh. I would have looked very, very cool. That's good. Yeah, I uh, we have a big tubing hill at my parents place. And one day it was really icy. But we thought it'd be fun to build the world's uh, biggest ramp at the bottom. And this is like a huge hill. Um, And so I went down it and flipped upside down and then slammed down and broke my shoulder. But like mid-injury photos would be a good option for this, I think. Just like peak expression of uh, what did my face look like as I was being hurt the most I've ever been hurt in my life. Heartbreak situations, you know, a lot like that. Oh, heartbreak would be good. Yeah. Yeah. When I played high school basketball, I was a post because I'm tall, so I never really got to do like three pointers. And uh, but then there was one random end of a quarter of a game, and we needed to win it to go to like the next round, where I was absolutely dumbing threes, and my coach was like freaking out because he's like, "Just pass it to Haley. Something's happening. Just pass Something's it to Haley. happening." <laughs> Literally, and I, to this day, I'm still not good at threes. I'm just like a. I just post. You were them. on. Yeah, you were on Fuego for like a moment. That is awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, like, I, I did, like, three threes in a row, and then the last three I landed won us the game by, like, a point. And I want a picture, because my team was like, what the hell? Like, it was, <laughs> oh. like, a, like, such a fun moment. I've never been good at I was like, Michael Jordan, like, that Like Mike movie. It was like, that happened to me <laughs> for half an hour, and then it went away. <laughs> That's I was an like, 80s movie. Minutes. You were in an 80s movie. Congratulations. That's, yeah. That's sweet. Uh, Sarah, photo? Anything about no, but I was thinking, like, for all those things that you, like, talk to your parents, and you're like, remember when this happened? And they go, I don't remember that. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, oh, no, it happened. I want a photo for every single one of those moments. I tell my mom something that happened to me as a child, and she goes, you know, I don't think that happened. <laughs> <laughs> I want evidence. Yeah, prove it. Absolutely. The one photo that I want is uh, my brother Johnny and I, also a Minnesota connection, Ooh. and he went to St. John's, and he, he lived in... Yeah, I lived in St. Paul forever. He was in a band there. Um, and so Johnny and I went to Europe when I was in college. He was like a senior in high school. And again, very Catholic. We went to go see the Pope. Uh, he was going to speak at the Brandenburg Gate. We were in Germany, in Berlin. And we went and we were there long before the crowd showed up. We were there like early morning. Um, and... We had been traveling together for three weeks. We were so tired of each other. We were really, really close. We were so tired of each other. that Johnny and I got into an argument, which turned into a fist fight Ooh. on the streets of Berlin. And as we were fist fighting, this is a true story. As we were fist fighting, who should drive by early but the Pope <laughs> in his Pope with green, heavy green glass. There's nobody on the street. My brother and I are like, God, you I'm going to kill you. And whoa, whoa, all these cars start driving by. So we do stop. We're like, they're like this. And sure enough, one of them is a white limousine with the papal key on the front of the car. And it's the Pope. And there's, this is John Paul. And there's nobody else there. And my brother's name is John Paul Solomon, by the way. He was whoa. named for this very Pope. Oh, my uh, God. There's nobody there. And so the Pope is just like, 
He's like waving it. He's just <laughs> waving at us. And I was like, what the hell was that? I was like, that That's was like, uh, yeah. So but, I want a photo of like that where my brother and I are like so mad at each other. Yeah. And there's like just the Pope in the background being like. But yeah. to the Pope's credit, which is what Min Max is all about, uh, you never fought again, did you? Uh, sure. Exactly. Let's say that. Exactly. And, uh, Look I, at that. We told my mother that who yes, who named my brother. I said, but we told my mother that and she cried. We, we <laughs> thought it was a funny story. She cried. She <laughs> oh, thought it was man. like she was like the the one time the Pope sees my children and you're <laughs> fist fighting on the streets of Berlin, and I was like, yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, all right. What do y'all like for question of the week here? What uh, what was your favorite? Uh, Jake, we'll, we'll put you on the scale here if you want to weigh it heavily. But let's see. Dream license to work with. Uh, he pitched his whole Messiah game. That's an option. Um, people just kissing Jake's ass in his past games. That's something. The dream question, question about Patreon and developers, I thought was interesting. Game design affecting other things in your life. What was the best I, question I thought of the, the, uh, the un... Um, the... Uh, under-respected element Ooh, of yes, game design. Yes. I thought was a good one. I thought that was a really good one. Love it. All right, that is Tech Beat Nick. Congratulations. Really, the best one was the one where they kissed my ass. So, <laughs> yeah, right, that was like a do? second place. And, yeah. I get it, I get it. All right, Tech Beat Nick, congratulations. I am 8-Bit. We'll ship out that prize right to you. Uh, now it is time for a segment that we call Get a Load of This. I've got to start warning guests that they can't hear the music that's playing, uh, but they should act as if like, they can. I was like, wait a minute, what the hell's happening? <laughs> uh, hey, get a little of this. Everybody's moving. <laughs> get a little of this. Uh, I was listening to a podcast recently, uh, the Designer Notes podcast, which I'm a fan of, and uh, Soren Johnson had one Jake Solomon on there for a two-parter oh. discussion that was like seven hours long. It was, it was ridiculous. Oh, my Lord. But I it, stayed over at his house, by the way, to do that really? because it was so long. I stayed uh, in his house and just woke up in the morning to do the second part, yeah. That's sweet. Uh, but in that discussion, you talked about something that I hadn't heard before, which was that one of, if not the first prototype for XCOM Enemy Unknown, an outside developer came and developed the prototype with you, and that developer was Psyonix, the Rocket League developer. That's right. That's, that's right. a weird thing. And they let me play their prototype well before it came out, and I remember thinking to myself, like, this is kind of a pile of shit, <laughs> um, which should tell you guys should. I think that should really just in case anybody's like, whoa, Jake's such a great designer. I'd be like, yeah, well, let me tell you how great of a designer I am. I played. I should have thrown everything in the air and been like, can I work for you guys? <laughs> Instead, I was like, I was like, sorry, guys, I happen to know game design and this ain't going to work. <laughs> so, yes, I think they only went on to make all the money ever made in the world. Yeah. So, yes. And I'm very happy with them. They were, they were awesome. They were super awesome. And they helped us make the first Exxon Pro. That's, That's true. Cool. Uh, anybody else got one there to throw in there? Get a yeah. load of this. Um, uh, the Stellar Blade has very good soundtrack. Uh, a video came across my YouTube page uh, a couple days ago, that's the singer of this very operatic boss theme, uh, just like in her living room performing the song. And it's so crazy to like just watch someone do opera, like wearing normal clothes in a <laughs> living room. But also she wrote that like she had to write the lyrics. And so oh. it's like, you know, it has it like the song has lyrics that are kind of about the boss and there's some stuff in like a different language. And there, she was like, yeah, I got to like write the lyrics to the song, which is about this boss. So it's the uh, the singer Pernell for the boss demo crawler and Stellar Blade. It's cool. There's links below for all this funky stuff. That's very cool. Uh, get a load of this. Marvel Rivals started doing their alpha. Yeah. And then they um, it came. It, you know, people were signing agreements in order to get key codes, and then everyone got all upset because there was a non-disparagement section, which I thought was fun. Uh, I can read it out loud. It just I says, saw that. Yeah, I was literally watching a streamer stream it, and he pulled like he found out about it. Really? Oh, it just says the content creator agrees not to make any public statements or engage in discussions that are detrimental to the reputation of the game. This includes, but is not limited to, making disparaging or satirical comments about any game-related material, such as game features, characters, or music. Engaging in malicious comparisons with competitors or belittling the gameplay or differences of Marvel Rivals. Marvel Rivals or providing subjective negative reviews of the game. So I, I was I like... Know. Is that genius? 
I'm sorry. Did somebody just invent a new way? I didn't know you could do that. I, I think this is probably taken out of context, and there's probably like 12 other things that apply to this that change what it means, which is on Twitter, I was like, someone please send me this. And it, it, a lot of people liked it and stuff, but no one sent me the agreement. God. So that's, it ended there. But I'll use the Bimax platform. If anyone has that agreement, send it to me. I really want to read it. Yeah, I so- will say... I can't remember what it is, but I have seen other Marvel agreements that were for like YouTube sponsorships that were similar to that. And and we like in our, you know, Slack where I discuss YouTube sponsorships with people, we were like, can you believe how bad this is? So it's like it's not the first time. Huh? Uh, yeah. For context. Better not be a meanie. That's what they're saying. Like, yeah, basically. Much. Be yeah. nice to us. Be like, it's the no haters clause, man. I'd be like, oh, <laughs> sorry, no haters. No haters. You can't play the game if you're a hater. Sorry. Sorry. No haters. I mean, Haley, it have might you... just be for the play test, I think. P- yeah. Perhaps. It's like just for that initial first period. It's like, can we at least keep finish? Can we finish the game before we absolutely dunk on it everywhere? Which, like, some people will say that's not even fair. It shouldn't, that shouldn't be in the agreement either. But yeah, I just want, you know, you can never just take a provision 2.1 out of agreement and think you just did a gotcha. There's always more context, and I want to know what it is. Yeah. Uh, Haley writes end user agreements uh, for context here for everybody. Um, Sarah, you got uh, some? Oh yeah, get a load of this. Fields of Mystery uh, official early access release date August fifth. I only want to throw up. We had somebody comment and they were like, "I'm going to count down every day," and then they Aww. they commented 87 days, and I was like, "If you." Every day on Twitter, at me with the amount of days until launch, I will become emotionally unwell. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Congratulations. Uh, let's see. Get a load of this. While well, Jake uh, plans for his haymaker, but get a load of this. Uh, from the community in the Discord, where people share these things all day, every day. Not weirder. Shared a video on Twitter, and it's of Animal Well. But you know in Animal Well, there's a lot of dangly things, like the vines and kind of the little... Uh, candles and stuff apparently if you put that game in windowed mode and then drag it around your desktop the physics are accurate for how you That's drag awesome. animal well around your desktop for everything dangling in that world weird stuff um love that okay jake here we go your big get a little list I chance don't have, why'd you put me at the end i don't <laughs> i thought you were coming up with something great I was trying to. And did you know if you move the windows around in some other game, the fines are physically accurate? That's oh. awesome. That's awesome, man. Thanks. That's awesome. Did you know Psionics helped me make the... Uh, all right. I, feel like, <laughs> I feel like we were partners on that one, man. I yeah. Like we were partners no, on that you're one. right. Oh, do you want one? I could, I could toss you one, Jake. It's kind of an yeah, LA yeah, situation. Yeah, okay, yeah. good. Um, this is... Jake reminded me of this fun fact earlier today. He was listening to this interview on um, NPR's Fresh Air, and it was about, like, the plant ecology and secret life of plants and all this stuff. And Jake yeah. told me that they told him from this radio show that apparently tomato plants, they, if a caterpillar is eating a tomato plant, they will emit. Uh, I, well, oh, sorry. Yes. You remember this? I, I did say this. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah keep going. Keep he, going. He, he would not stop talking about these tomato plants. So if a caterpillar is Love eating it. a tomato plant, it'll emit a chemical that will turn the caterpillar into a cannibal. And it will then become more interested in eating other caterpillars and continuing to eat that that tomato plant. Oh, I thought, well, I thought you were going to say it's going to eat itself. Ooh, It'd that'd be even better. That'd be a stronger chemical, I think. That's the second level. But That's horrible. Yeah. Jake, that's horrible. Why would you bring that fact here? Well, I don't know. I just wondered if that wasn't a great game mechanic. Like, we love zombies, uh, right? Like, cannibal something about tomatoes. Mm. There's like, yeah, there's like cannibal the... Cannibal pitter? What's, what's yeah, the Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's got to be something there. Right? Absolutely, I think there's something yeah. there. Um, well, so hey. if you eat, yeah, as it said, because I do remember. I mean, Terry Gross. I mean, I just love. <laughs> yes, I listen to Fresh Air all the time. Uh-huh. The uh, if you, the leaves of a tomato, right? Was it? Is that what I said? It was you the did. leaves you, of a tomato plant. You, you insisted okay. it was the leaves of the tomato. Yeah. Hey. Okay. I- so yeah, that <laughs> is different than eating the actual tomato plant. So yeah, what if you smoke the leaves of a tomato plant? What happens then? That's what I want to know. That's a story, baby. Uh, Jake Solomon, thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I love Min Max. I'm very, very thankful to be here. Oh, that's very sweet. Um, if people want to follow Midsummer Studios, follow the, the Top Secret Project, uh, where should they go? What should they do? Uh, the website, midsummerstudios.com. Um, 
the uh, Twitter is it's midsummer, and then yeah, we're hey yeah, we we uh, we will be uh, showing stuff off soon once we have something worth showing. We we are right in the middle of making stuff, so hopefully we'll have stuff to show soon. Okay, soon. I mean. You're saying absolutely not popping up at the uh, Keeley Summer Game Fest thing. It's going to be a while before you got a trailer ready to go. Something yeah, like that. Uh, not that soon. Not okay. That soon. Okay. People should go pre order Fields of Mystery. That's what they should hey. do. Hey. Like, hey. Uh, it's on Steam. <laughs> Hell yeah. All right. Uh, that's it for this episode of the Min Max Show. Thanks, everybody, for watching or listening to this whole thing. We do have a couple odds and ends to plug. We did the Dungeons and Dragons one off. Uh, the one shot, uh, because we hit our Patreon goal. We streamed that last week. It's up on YouTube, and it's in the bonus podcast feed if you're a $5 supporter on Patreon, where you get an ad-free early version of this podcast, but also the full one shot with Charles Hart, who was an amazing DM. Uh, He pulled that together so fast, and then Sarah and Leo and I uh, had a very good time. Sarah, it genuinely melted my heart when you tweeted out about how much you enjoyed doing that. Because I was so scared of like yeah. letting you down as a big D&D fan. It's like, oh, th- she's going to think that we're just rookies, not knowing what's going on, how to progress the story. So I'm glad you enjoyed yourself. Mm-hmm. As long as you're with friends, D&D is fun. Yeah. I loved watching it. Like, it was so fun to watch y'all. You did such a good job. Oh, that's sweet. Thank you. Yeah, it's it was 90% Charles. So <laughs> shout out to him for putting all that stuff together as the DM. Uh, bonus pod, the Patreon exclusive podcast with Haley McLean. Uh, this week's episode, talk about the full story of Janet's engagement. Uh, uh, more of a mummy review from 1999 yeah, than I expected on bonus pod. Review. But that was good. Yeah, I'm trying to think the other standout things from this week. She told us all about her John Wick pinball yeah, experiences. That's right. There's that's right. pieces of his jacket or something in the pinball <laughs> machines. And that there's, that's why there's only a limited number of them. Which yeah. Is, what the heck? Of course. It's bizarre. Um, the other thing is Town Showdown. Uh, we are having a MinMax community meetup. And the fun thing, Jake, is we uh, had everybody who supports us on Patreon pitch their hometown for where we fly out to for this big community meetup. And so we went through... Ooh, that's cool. It's cool. So we went through hundreds and hundreds of people suggesting hundreds and hundreds of towns around the United States. Uh, we got it down to seven um, in this town showdown stream. So you can check out uh, that archive on our YouTube channel for us going through that full list of different towns. It's also in that bonus podcast feed if you want the podcast version of it. It was a super fun time. So we got it down to seven, and that vote then is coming up this Monday. If you're a Patreon supporter at any tier, you can vote for where the big community meetup is going to be happening in September. The seven towns that are the finalists for the big community meetup. Ketchum, Idaho... Asheville, North Carolina, Akron, Ohio, Williamsburg, Virginia, Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, Gloucester, Massachusetts, or San Marcos, Texas. Those are the seven finalists for the community meetup. So if you live near one of those and you want to vote for us to come near your area, near your hometown, uh, you can by becoming a Patreon supporter, even at that $2 tier. So we are going to lock down the dates once we lock down the location, but I'm very excited to see what people choose out of the final seven. We tried to be as fair as possible around the United States and find not the big cities, but something that still wouldn't be a pain in the ass to get to. So shout out to everybody for submitting some great options there. Um, and hey, I do think that is it for this episode of the MinMax Show podcast. Thanks again to everybody. Jake, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it, sir. Happy to be here. Awesome. I'll be back soon. All right. Sounds good. You're welcome whenever you want. And that's it. So be good. Have fun. Let's go. Let's go.